Alpha Dane, the Committee on Justice is now called to order. I'm sorry, the Committee on Health, Tourism, Historic Preservation, Land and Justice is now called to order. It is Thursday, September 10th, 2020, and the time is about approximately 5.07 p.m. Notices for this public hearing were disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on Wednesday, September 2, 2020, and again on Tuesday, September 8, 2020. The notice was also published in the Guam Daily Post on Wednesday, September 2, and Tuesday, September 8, 2020. The general rules of conduct for this hearing are as follows. This Zoom meeting is hosted by the Guam Legislature's MIS staff the committees, and my committee staff. The host will mute all Zoom participants until called upon by the chair. Members of the committee or the legislature wishing to speak may indicate their desire to the chair through the in-app chat feature. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and begin by stating their names for record keeping purposes. When called to speak, please ensure that you are unmuted. The order of questioning for this hearing will begin with the chairperson followed by the panel of senators. We, we may have to do our questioning rounds depending on time constraints. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. The personal inference as to the character or the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violations of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the public hearing by the host. I'd now like to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues including uh, Speaker Barnes, Senator Minority Leader Pelo Taitigui, and Senator James Moylan. Thank you colleagues for being here today. I'd also like to acknowledge the, president, the presence of agency officials, including of course, the Acting Director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services, Arts and Augustine, Deputy and the Division Administrators uh, and program leads who are attending this evening's hearings. Prior to the start of this hearing, all of the Department of Public Health and Social Services uh, representatives who are present were sworn in by our Sergeant of Arms. There are two major agenda items for this evening. First, the oversight hearing to receive updates from the Department of Public Health and Social Services on specific, on one topic only, and that is an, um, the contact tracing and investigations. We are all aware that Department of Public Health and Social Services has within its mandates a long list of tasks, programs, divisions, from community health centers, disease prevention, welfare, running shelters, ensuring child care schools and businesses operate safely and within regulations, and many, many more mandates. We have reserved tonight's oversight for the specific topic of contact tracing and investigations in regard to COVID-19, because we believe the capability of Department of Public Health and Social Services and the success of these efforts, more than anything, will allow our community, our economy to function safely. Discussions for the first hour and a half will be limited to this topic. We will then discuss whether the governor's nominee for the director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services, Mr. Arthur Use and Augustine, is capable and should be confirmed by the legislature to oversee all the mandates of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. As a shortcut for the rest of the night, I will be referring to the Department of Public Health and Social Services simply as public health, and I hope uh, you uh, forgive me for that. <laughs> just, I just don't want to take up more time than necessary. Okay, so we will begin with the, the oversight. <laughs> Sorry, my phone is so delayed. Just give me one second. Okay, so the over we will begin. First, with the oversight hearing to receive updates from the department and about tracing and investigations goals, strategies and resources 
Status of CARES Act funding requests and other federal funding for case investigations and contact tracing. Status of hiring, the implementation and results of the COVID-19 tracing apps, including EMOCA for direct communication with patients and safe places software for contact tracing of positive individuals and other technology. And we heard today of the rollout of the other app. So we will also hear about that. And second, we want to hear from the department as to the the public disclosure protocol for case investigation and contact tracing information. The, particularly the effectiveness as a COVID-19 mitigation strategy, including whether turnaround time and location and de activity details are sufficient for this purpose. If there are any legal parameters prohibiting the disclosure of this data, the management and mining of the data, and the tracing of, and whether the data includes the Naval Hospital cases and, and whether we are going to be able to include all, all data relative to Guam. I'd also like to recognize the president of uh, Senator Will Castro. Just give me one minute. I think I need to do this. I'm going to start appreciating more next story. Church. All right. So just a very brief background as to why we have called the Department of Public Health and Social Services here tonight uh, for public informational purposes in case investigations and contact tracing protocol and as an overview of the eff efforts of public health. Um, the CDC recommends that the initiation of case investigation and contact tracing activities should be implemented at two distinct points in an epidemic. First, early on during the containment phase. Case investigation and contact tracing are needed to stop transmission and, and prevent a large outbreak from occurring. If efforts to contain the epidemic are unsuccessful and widespread transmission occurs in the community, then stricter communi community mitigation measures, such as stay at home orders, business disclosures, and other efforts must be implemented. If the strict mitigation measures are effective, transmission will begin to decline and community will enter a suppression phase. Once the community enters the suppression phase of the epidemic, the jurisdiction should begin to implement or scale up case investigation and contact tracing activities before the mitigation measures are fully lifted in order to continue to reduce community transmission. On March 16, 2020, in response to the first confirmed cases of COVID-19, Governor issued Executive Order 2020-04, ordering the first closures of non-essential government of Guam offices, the closure of all schools, prohi prohibition of large gatherings of no more than 50 people, and mandatory social distancing directives. In an oversight hearing he held on May 8, 2020, two days before the lifting of the first stay-at-home order, former Director DeNorsi was asked if the Department of Public Health was prepared for the opening of businesses and had the capacity to promptly and adequately trace any potential cases in order to control the spread. 
She testified that the department was prepared, had been training additional staff, had received grants to implement tracing and hire additional personnel. Again, during the FY21 budget hearing for public health held on uh, June 24, when asked if public health had the permanent capacity to swiftly test, investigate, and trace, Denorsi and Trace, test Denorsi and Trace, test Denorsi and Trace. Director Denorsi, Director Denorsi, that public health had a plan that was awaiting final approval by the federal government on the end of the epidemiology laboratory capacity and that extra federal funding was available and that at the suggestion made by this committee during the oversight hearing had submitted a request for additional coronavirus relief funds to add additional personnel to the Division of General Administration, Division of Public Health, Public Welfare and Environmental Health. She also informed that plans were in motion to increase nursing capacity from 49 to 91 staff inclusive of RNs, LPNs, and nurse aides, and to increase capacity for contact tracing with the assistance of the Guam Army National Guard, Department of Labor staff, the CDC Foundation, and the Pacific Island Health Officers Association. As we are all aware, on August 6, 2020, the island was placed back into PCOR-1 status with the recent surge in positive cases and hospitalizations. Public Health has publicly stated that, that with the surge in positive cases, there has been a, a slight lag with the completion of tracing from a targeted 24-hour period to sometimes two to three days, and that a call out for help to close the gap was put out. Public Health is currently receiving assistance from staff across other divisions, including DYA, or departments, including DYA, Department of Labor, Guam Memorial Hospital, Port Authority of Guam, and the University of Guam. Recently conducted a training with uh, UCSF, I believe, that was completed on September 4th, uh, including nursing students, staff, other students, and personnel from the judiciary, the National Guard, and other government agencies. Um, we have sent letters to the acting director appealing to the Department of Public Health to increase efforts to ensure timely and adequate release of contract tracing information and other facts to the public to allow the public to adequately assess the potential level of exposure for themselves and their families and to take proper actions or to change their behavior appropriately. In, our la in one of our meetings, uh, we were informed that the department was awaiting guidance from the attorney general on the parameters of information that could be released to the public. The department has um, recently launched digital exposure notification applications that we will hear more details about tonight. And um, prior to the launch of these apps, uh, they had been working for several months on, on other apps. The committee called the department to this oversight hearing to receive updates on these issues and the questions and concerns that have been brought to their attention by the media, the public, and other senators. The goal is to obtain a clear picture of where we are today with our case investigations and contact tracing capacity, where we, uh, so that we will all know what is being done by the Department of Public Health and what will need to be done outside of the Department of Public Health and how the government and the private sectors can consistently support these efforts to effectively and swiftly mitigate the impact of this virus in our community in, and in the long run. After the presentation by the department, we will receive questions from the panel of senators. And Acting Director San Augustine, if you could please uh, introduce your team uh, to those who are watching and to the senators here, and uh, you may begin. Thank you. That's all right. We, we got to call Lori out. Could you sit on the computer, please? Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, Chairman Terlahi, Speaker Barnes, Senators Moylan, Senator Talatai, Senator Will Castro, uh, 
I hope I didn't miss any of the other senators. Uh, this afternoon, I would like to introduce my team was with me today to provide an update on our efforts for COVID-19 uh, in very specific areas of contact case investigations and contact tracing. Uh, Deputy Director Lori Duenas uh, is with me this afternoon, as well as Deputy Director Terry Adjun. From the Division of Public Health, we have the Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Suzanne Kaneshiro, from Environmental Health Chief Environmental Health Officer, Administrator, Mr. Tom Nadeau, our Administrative Services Officer, Mr. Tom Tidegui, from the Division of Senior Citizens, Acting Senior Citizens Administrator, Charlene Sinicolas, uh, from the Bureau of Communicable Disease Control Administrator, Annette Uggen, uh, we have from the BCDC Bureau of Communicable Disease Control also, with them is uh, Gina M. Walken, our Public Information Officer for the Department, who really emphasis on COVID-19 information, Janella Carrera, also in our PIO response effort, uh, we have Grace Berdalio, uh, the Division of Public Welfare Chief, uh, Therese Teresa Archangel, our Medical Director from our Division of Public Health Central Facility, which is not existing today, Dr. Jenna Melonia, and our Territorial Epidemiologist, Dr. Ampovitsky, our Lab Administrator, Anne Marie Santis, and I believe that is the team that is waiting with me this afternoon. Thank you, Director. You have a presentation. Would you like to proceed? You are welcome to. Thank you very much, Chairman Trilahi. Uh, yes, actually, we do. The team has prepared for um, the oversight this afternoon. So we will be talking in reference to the agenda that you had laid out for us, Senator Chair, Chairman, Chairwoman. My apologies. So we've got contact tracing and investigations the funding of the CARES Act for contract tracing and investigations, the status of hiring, implementations of applications for COVID-19, public disclosure protocol. And so we'll start this afternoon's presentation with the Division of Public Health in case investigations on contract tracing. We'll start with Annette and then the team has already been uh, laid out in terms of who will speak first and in what order. So let's go ahead and begin our presentation to the committee this afternoon. Annette, you can start, thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Speaker Mee Barnes and uh, all honorable senators. Uh, in regards to contact tracing, again, our overall goal has always been to prevent the further spread of, of an infectious disease by separating individuals who have been identified as either confirmed or probable with COVID, as well as identifying their contacts because they may have been exposed and possibly infected with the virus. And so that's the overall goal of case investigation and contact tracing to identify, to uh, separate, monitor them, provide them whatever support they need, and, and just to, uh, to prevent the further spread of transmission. Uh, from the start of this outbreak in March, we initially had a team of only six investigators and six contact tracers, all within the Division of Public Health Bureau of Communicable Disease Control. That included two of our CDC public health associates assigned to Guam. Um, as we saw, uh, the up and down of our cases, uh, we continue to expand by adding in more personnel. In May, we ended up having nine investigators and eight contact tracers by pulling within other divisions of our department. And that now in, in September, as we are dealing with the largest surge to date, uh, we have scaled up to 20 investigators as well as 24 contact tracers. And now this is even reaching outside of our department. We are looking at Guam Department of Labor uh, we have DYA assisting us. We have our partners at Port Authority of Guam and GPA who have their own two to three contact tracing team, as well as um, within our other, um, I apologize. We are working with University of Guam to further expand uh, the workforce capacity. You did mention the UOG UCSF training. And so from that training, we are looking at uh, piloting a project to have at least a team of five contact tracers at the University of Guam uh, and to implement a contact tracing team there that can help augment the department as well. Uh, they would have their own computers and their own phones uh, uh, to assist us uh, should there be uh, future surges or to give some relief to our, our personnel who have been doing this nonstop. In regards to case investigation, uh, the timeliness, yes, uh, we do plan that the goal is always to initiate case investigation within 24 hours of that report being uh, received by the health department. And that is the goal also by CDC. 
to complete an, uh, a case investigation and contact tracing, it does vary from case to case, depending on several factors, such as uh, how many contacts are we looking at? Uh, the, the extent of the exposure, is it just outside? Is it only in the home or is it outside the home? We're looking at work or multiple locations. Uh, the volume of contacts that need to be uh, reached as well as uh, working phone numbers and accurate address. And so that uh, the idea would be to finish these case investigations as quickly as possible. And so we've had success in that where sometimes the investigation and contact tracing is done within the hour because they're all at home. Um, and other times it does take a, a day or two in order to uh, get additional information because the number of contacts has gone to another household or to another job uh, or to another function. Uh, in regards to our ability to scale up, again, we're being flexible. We've had the ability to have contact tracers be trained up to become investigators. And so our investigators do uh, have the dual role of investigation and contact tracing. Uh, we do continue to recruit for the LTA positions funded uh, under our epidemiology and laboratory capacity uh, program COVID grants. And so we did request for 14 positions for contact investigators and contact tracers. And I know we will discuss that a little, a little bit further on in, under the status of hiring uh, component of this hearing. Uh, we Yes, we have dealt with the backlog uh, that was uh, brought up into public last week because of the huge surge that we've had in August. Our staff continue to work diligently nights, weekends, and even the holiday uh, so that we can uh, catch up on that. And with the additional resources, uh, we are looking at bringing that down to two to three backlog, day backlog. But again, the ultimate goal is to go back to what we had in the beginning of initiating case investigation within 24 hours of the report. Um, and I believe that's the extent, ma'am. Are there any other questions or if I may have missed any section? Uh, no, I'm not going to take questions right now. We'll let you all uh, complete your presentation first. Thank you. Okay. So, Thank you, so can we go ahead and just keep presenting, please? Let's just go ahead. Right. You understand, Dr. King, you're, you're going to be also speaking. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me over there. And so in, in, uh, in, uh, in terms of positive individuals or contacts who refuse to cooperate with investigations, we, we tried numerous attempts to have them uh, um, uh, tell us um, what, who the contacts are. If that doesn't work, we usually look to their family members to give us information or their coworkers. So we do try numerous attempts when we have people that refuse to cooperate. So we do persist and until we actually get the information we need. So that's, the, that's what happens if they refuse to cooperate. Now, I can begin to report with the uh, status of the CARES Act funding request and other federal funding for case investigations and contact tracing. To begin with, uh, the governor's approved COVID CARES Act relief fund of that 117 million point nine that was received by the governor, uh, 313,000 was allotted for testing, 397,000 was allotted to public health, um, and then also we were committed a uh, $3 million to provide for additional uh, staff and also uh, to provide for shortfalls in the areas of equipment, uh, supplies, uh, and uh, services. Now, with the $313,000 that was earmarked for testing, that was uh, reprogrammed or recategorized to provide for our, our quarantine facility provider. And so we paid out the 313,000 to that provider for, uh, for the first two months, I believe. And with the remaining 397,000, 
um, initially air, uh, allotted to public health, that's still available. And we, uh, we, we plan to submit uh, a breakdown of how we intend to use that, the funds, the remaining funds. And we want to use that to offset the, uh, any immediate requirements for our response for in the beginning of this fiscal, this upcoming fiscal year. So as we transition into FY21, we intend to use the, re the re remaining 397 to uh, offset costs that we're, we're, we're going to require. Sorry, no. Todd, can you just repeat the source of the, that, those funds? What is that source? That's the uh, coronavirus relief fund that was uh, approved back in May. From the governor? Yes, from the 117.9 million. All right, okay, please continue. Uh, and that's pretty much a status of, with regard to the 3 million that, that's committed for public health to, to uh, bring on board uh, an additional 30 staff and, and, and also provide for additional PPEs and, and equipment. And right now, as it, it it's, uh, though it's committed, it's, it's not allotted yet. So we're, we're just pending uh, the assignment of the, the account. And then once that, once that's in place, we can begin, we can, we can begin to move forward to use that, use those funds. Now, with regard to other federal funds that were provided to public health, we received a total of like $22 million from, from uh, our respective, different respective uh, uh, funding agencies, uh, federal agencies, and more specific to uh, tracing and uh, contact tracing and investigation, uh, we received awards in the epidemiology and laboratory capacity, our, our grants coming from there, I mean, from CDC for, for, the, for that program, as well as for the community health centers. Now, the, with the ELC, we received approximately 6.1 million. And with the, the CHCs, which is the community health centers, we received 1.2 million. Of the total, 7.3 million, right? We've used 953,000 to date, and that's like 13.5% of, of what was granted. Now, one thing to note is with the ELC grants, they're, they're good through 2022 as to where with the CHC grants, one is uh, two are good for through September 2021, or excuse me, March 2021, and July, or excuse me, September of this year, 2020. So, and as I mentioned, of those amounts, uh, 424,000 was spent by so far by the, the community health centers. Tom, you wanna go ahead and uh, talk about? Sure. Sure, uh, half a day, Madam Chair, and uh, speaker, and the uh, others on this call. Uh, my name is Tom Nodo. I am the Chief Environmental Public Health Officer with the Division of Environmental Health. As Mr. Tommy Taitoki just stated, uh, our division, Environmental Health, will be seeking to utilize the funds uh, from the CARES Act to recruit 10 personnel for the inspection of island businesses in the enforcement of the COVID mitigation requirements and the sanitation inspections of the island's health regular establishments. And also just today, I was informed that we received a recruitment packet to interview applicants to fill two vacant inspector positions and that we should expect to receive additional lists for the remaining two funded vacancies tomorrow. So hopefully uh, by end of this fiscal year, we'll have new inspectors on board. Uh, but in the interim, we'll continue to divert 
uh, resources, specifically the personnel from other division programs to conduct inspections. And this will include the use of uh, non-inspectors of the division for simple routine inspection that doesn't require any specialized training, knowledge, or experience. So we are hopeful to add new bodies into our division by end of the fiscal year. Thank you. Okay, so in the status of hiring, the Division of Public Health is planning to create another bureau called the Bureau of Emerging Diseases. We're going to be uh, hiring uh, personnel using ELC money to start with. So that funding will run until 2022. So hopefully by then we can seek other grants to pay for the personnel that we're going to be hired. So we're going to be hiring uh, contact tracers, nurses, um, microbiologists, um, investigators, coordinators to populate the bureau. So in terms of it being covered in the FY21 budget, it is covered under the ELC grant. Thank you. Hey, Chairwoman uh, Herlahi, Madam Speaker, and to the 35th Guam Legislature. Um, so regarding the, the uh, Guam Code Alert app that was launched, officially launched um, this morning. Uh, so the app, um, the purpose of this app is uh, to aid in uh, contact tracing. Um, and uh, so the, the safe places the um, was originally called Safe Places uh, early on in the year uh, and eventually uh, adopted the name Path Check. And so um, Safe Places became Path Check. And for Guam, um, it's called the Guam COVID Alert app. So they're all one and the same. Um, so the purpose of it, again, is to aid in uh, contact tracing. It's a digital uh, contact tracing app. Um, and, and again, it's to reduce the spread of uh, COVID-19 here in Guam. Um, so the uh, maintenance uh, of the app is uh, done by the Office of Technology. Uh, there is no cost to the government of Guam, and there is also no cost to the user of the app. It's free, it's available in the App Store, uh, as well as the uh, Google Play Store. Um, the, uh, as far as guards, uh, there's for privacy, it's been assured by the, uh, developers of the app, Google and Apple, as well as the path check foundation, um, that, uh, the, there's no tracking of the location. Um, there's no personal information, uh, that's being shared by, uh, to Google or Apple, or even with, uh, public health, uh, um, uh, officers or officials, um, and really the the only information are um, Bluetooth keys that are being shared by the phones of the uh, users who download the app. Um, the status and purpose um, uh, so again, the status and, and the purpose of the app is really just to. Um, to aid in, in contact tracing and to contain the spread of COVID-19 on Guam. So ma'am, the status of um, IMOCA, um, currently IMOCA is still in use and will be phased out, will be phased out in um, December of this year. We have a contract with um, IMOCA from April of 2020 to December for outbreak monitoring, but that will end in um, December of this year. But we are, uh, we are moving over to Sarah a lot for the same purpose. So um, we have two systems for the Sarah a lot. One system will be used to monitor incoming travelers on the island if we get to that, that point and it has a capacity of monitoring 100,000 people. And then we also have another um, Sarah Alert component that is called the Guam Respond. 
And that also has a capacity to monitor 100,000 people at the same time. So this is, this the, the Sora Alert system is, um, is designed to be able to enroll um, at risk individuals for public health to monitor. It also allows us to register or to enroll individuals and their household to monitor their symptoms either by using um, email, smartphone, text message, or call in. It also have a, it also has a referral um, system that is built in. And the good thing about the app is that it is designed in such a way that is um, disease independent. So after this pandemic, we can actually use it for another epidemic or another disease specific uh, um, response in future. And um, what I also want to point out is that um, the emphasis on uh, um, um, contact tracing, the quarantine and isolation section supports contact tracing. And we do this by successfully uh, isolating positive cases and their family members while CI, um, contact investigation is going on. So like you mentioned, Madam Senator, this is, this is the, the, the real mitigation strategy that public health has in place. So when individuals are identified as positives, the quarantine and isolation team actually moves in to successfully isolate the individual to cut off transmission and also identify their family members to also quarantine them. That also gives a good turnaround time for the, um, the contact um, investigator and the contact tracing team to actually get into um, action. But at the same time, public health would have at that point successfully controlled and, and um, isolated um, the individual who is infected. So that, that is a mitigation strategy that we have in public health as a support to um, see uh, the contact investigation group. Thank you. Madam Chair, before the Guam COVID alert was launched this morning, um, the level of exposure of a close contact to a person who was tested positive was determined by the case investigator during an interview with a close contact. And the Guam COVID alert uses the CDC definition of a close contact, um, notifying the person who downloads the um, the Guam COVID alert app that they were within six feet and was exposed to uh, a known positive case for at least 15 minutes. Prior to the Guam COVID alert, um, for 26 weeks now, our communications team, which includes our education community health outreach team, has gone out to radio stations. We have 11 radio stations who do PSAs um, for free. So we are on 11 radio stations, six messages a day. Um, we've done posters and flyers. If you go out to retail shops, restaurants, you'll see the posters that we've done since February. Um, we, through our partnerships with the Joint Information Center, we do news releases multiple times a day. We give out the phone numbers of our medical triage. If a person is concerned that they were a close contact, they can call 311 option one. They can call our medical triage numbers. Um, we're active in social media and um, by WhatsApp. Thank you. Thank you. That was Grace Garces Perdalio. Right? I'm just going to say that for the record. Okay. And I, I'd like to include that our website has a lot of information. If they go to the COVID-19 page, all of the Joint Information Center news releases, and even before the pandemic was declared a public health emergency on March 14, we were doing joint information releases since January 19 with the governor's office and Homeland Security. And we also have a dashboard that tells um, information in positive cases. We give profiles of confirmed cases, where, where the village that they live, um, the age, the gender, and the ethnic background. So I believe our department is really forthcoming on, on the positive cases. I'd also um, like to add 
into that as well. Um, it, uh, we, Grace and I are part of the Joint Information Center, uh, which is made up of um, uh, the governor's office, the Department of Public Health and Social Services, as well as Guam Homeland Security and partners um, with the um, Joint Region Marianas and uh, public information officers with various agencies within the government of Guam. Um, and we release information uh, as long as there is a public health emergency or any type of emergency that's declared um, uh, daily. And that's what Grace was referring to. Um, so we, we released information with the Joint Information Center daily and um, most of our data is included in the Joint Information Center. Uh, we also have the SITREP, the Situation Report, that includes um, uh, data on COVID-19, which um, has epidemiological information in there. Uh, and that goes out um, Monday to Friday um, and not including holidays. Uh, but that has uh, a wealth of information on COVID-19 as well. And like Grace mentioned, our website, dphss.com.gov, has all the executive orders that have ever been released, all of the guidance memos, every quarantine protocol that's ever been released. Um, it's, it's all in there. So we're very forthcoming with the information um, it, it, that uh, we have. Thank you. If I could take this opportunity to acknowledge the presence of uh, the vice chair for the Committee on Health is Senator Sabina Paris. Welcome, Senator. Um, back to you, Acting Director. If there's any anything else? Any changes in protocol? No, no. I understand Dr. Aaron Kravitsky was um, also going to put a, put a piece out this afternoon. Is she on mute? No, she's on no, mute. There she is. Regarding the um, announcement of public to the public of, of policy going forward regarding the release of data on positive cases and or the list of establishments and public establishments or public areas and venues or events where possible exposure may have taken place. We are currently reviewing the legal opinion of the Attorney General's office that was just submitted to us yesterday, I believe, or the other day. And we will be creating a policy around um, this kind of disclosure. At the same time, uh, as Janella mentioned, the daily situation report does provide a wealth of information. What we are in the process of doing is streamlining the daily situation report. And we've already developed a template for a weekly report with the kinds of detailed information that have been requested, including naming um, the clusters that may have occurred, not by name of establishment, but by the type of establishment. For example, if it was a bar or a funeral or a church, as well as we're working um, with the quarantine team to get more detailed information on um, tracing investigation efforts uh, on people who were advised to home quarantine. So we're working on getting those data. And I will say more uh, later on about management and mining of data. Thank you. Thank you, and that was, could you just state your name for the record, please? Ann, P Ann Pabutsky. Thank you very much. Oh. Just put it. No. Don't make the unmute you. Terry, you can speak up. They'll hear you. Terry. Yes, she is. Yeah, but you can speak to the owl. Hello, Annette. Yes, yes, sir. Sorry. Um, in regards to um, the okay, measures that we're implementing. State your name one more time and your position, just so that those who are watching can keep track of who is speaking at, at what time. Okay, please. Yes. I understood, Madam Chairman. I apologize. Annette, again, Administrator of Public Health, uh, Bureau of Community Disease Control. Uh, in regards to 
um, whether we have evaluated, evaluated the current, you know, public disclosure of tracing information, um, you know, we're still in a response mode right now. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, evaluate all the information. As Dr. Babitsky says, we're still collecting it and we will be uh, diving deeper into that information uh, in regards to the effectiveness, uh, you know, as we're still responding. However, we have adjusted accordingly, uh, as uh, mentioned by uh, Chima and Janela that we've, uh, and Grace about the Guam COVID alert app. And so now we're, you know, we're trying to digitize so that we can move from being 100% manual to, to helping uh, speed up and be more efficient. And so those by utilizing the various digital tools, this will definitely help us in regards to our, our tracing efforts uh, and having um, more uh, the ability to increase the, the awareness of the public and so that they can play their role and also be aware whether they were exposed or not. Um, and so definitely we want to move forward and, and when the number of caseloads go down and the, the data extraction and collection is done by our surveillance unit, then we can definitely uh, evaluate our processes and our procedures and how can we further improve. Uh, and again, combining both manual and uh, automated uh, tools uh, to help improve our response efforts uh, moving forward. Uh, since we all anticipate this will be a while um, and, and we'll have uh, more waves to come. Uh, the challenge of uh, providing more detailed information again, with the new uh, guidance given from the legal counsel, uh, we will definitely uh, be working on our, our department policy so that we can be consistent and standard moving forward. Uh, again, balancing uh, releasing of information, but also ensuring that we are complying with uh, the HIPAA to protect personal health information. Uh, and so that will be forthcoming, ma'am, in regards to our de department guidance on releasing names of establishments. Uh, and then moving forward, I, I'm giving it back to Dr. Pobitsky in regards to the management and mining of data. Yes, thank you. Uh, data on all positive COVID-19 cases, <clears throat> including positive close contacts, are summarized daily in the situation report and on the public health dashboard um, website. The um, cases are assessed as to the number confirmed or probable, number by symptom and onset date, the number of tests done daily and cumulative total since March, cases status, including currently active isolation, not in isolation, and quarantine locations, residents, and other demographic variables, including age, sex, ethnicity, along with epidemiological links, including travel, household, community, or worse, workplace contact, and clustering of cases. It also includes testing by laboratory and testing by day of the test, pandemic condition of readiness assessment uh, by seven day rolling averages. Everything we've done um, from the beginning follows CDC guidelines on case definitions and other criteria. That's it, unless there are any questions. As I said, we, were, we are gonna be revamping the daily sit rep to make it more streamlined along with the dashboard. And we are gonna start doing a weekly uh, surveillance report with some of this more detailed information that has been requested. It's just a work in progress. Okay, so when you said it's available, it's uh, it's not necessarily always available to the public. It's going, but you're going to make it available uh, on an ongoing basis. We we hope so. For example, we are working with the quarantine team to get some of this more detailed information. It's it's, it's you know they're they're busy with the isolation and quarantine facility, so compiling data we want to get the data if they can compile it we will work with them to get that and other data that we don't have that we'd like to get our hospital we don't have get data from the hospitals and we would like to include hospitalization data so we're working on that as well all right thank you Madam Chair, and again, again, uh, and this is in regards to the, the tracing of Naval Hospital cases. Um, we continue to partner with Anderson Air Force Base and U.S. Naval Hospital. Um, with the military, they, uh, the assigned military unit are the ones who handle their service members. So if they're air, airmen, they, Anderson Air Force Base Public Health takes care of them. U.S. Naval Hospital will take care of the sailors. The National Guard will take care of their, their guardmen. Uh, U.S. Naval Hospital also serves as a catch-all for any member who is not assigned to a, a unit here on Guam, or if, let's say they're a retiree, veteran, or a dependent. The, the DOD will 
will handle the investigations for those individuals that they test at their facility and also for the contacts that are identified as a result of that uh, testing and investigation. Uh, there have been instances where based on their capacity, uh, DOD will refer civilian contacts to the department for us to do testing as well as to do follow up. Uh, so there was that instance where several weeks ago, day two were being overwhelmed. Uh, they had a, uh, they were dealing with the surge. And so again, we continue to have weekly coordination meetings. And actually two weeks ago, we have added on the Guam National Guard in this weekly meeting so that we are all on the same page. And this weekly meeting is to do a, a quick check-in uh, to, to dis discuss cases, uh, to talk about trends and any other, if there's any clusters, uh, just so that everyone is kept abreast of, of what's going on in our respective um, facilities and our, our responsibilities. Uh, in regards to the question of, of their transparency uh, and releasing information, uh, there was the difficulty from the military cluster that was well publicized a few months ago. Uh, but with these weekly report, uh, meetings, uh, the constant communication, uh, we are definitely uh, have improved on that. Uh, they also face the challenges of uh, getting complete, accurate, reliable information during their investigation, similar to how we experience with uh, you know, the public health contact tracers and case investigators. And so again, uh, through this collaboration and, and weekly uh, conference calls, uh, we've improved in our partnership and our communication. Uh, in regards to uh, public health being provided information on the active service members uh, cases, uh, unfortunately, they do not provide us the active case, uh, active uh, cases who are service members. Um, but they do give us uh, the report, uh, like aggregate information they identified uh, in regards to within the 24 hours of reporting, similar to what our public and private healthcare providers also report to us for COVID cases. Uh, they, they did give us on the civilian context and that's the one where we will handle accordingly in regards to further testing or investigation or contact tracing as needed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, this is our presentation this afternoon and um, it covered many different areas, but of course we're here this afternoon to provide any additional updates or responses and if we need to provide additional information after the oversight, we definitely are able and willing to do that as well. So um, we're here for any questions from you, ma'am. Uh, the Vice Chair, Senator Sabina Ferris, and any other member of the legislative body this afternoon. Thank you so much, Sherwin Chirwati. Thank you very much, director and deputies and all of you who've made presentations tonight. And uh, I know this is just a snapshot of all the work that you are doing and it we could not discuss in one night all the work that you are doing. So I wanna thank you all, first of all, for all the work and thank you for you know uh, allowing this snapshot of your work. And I know that all these, you know, calling you in for regular oversights, uh, I, I know that you're, pretty swamped with meetings. And so I, I, I very much hesitate to do it often only because you are the ones who are actually compiling the data that I am asking you to produce to the public and things like that. So I would rather that you do that uh, and get that out regularly and as much as you can. And I'm hoping that with your additional hiring that you will be able to do this uh, more and more and more. I mean, I'm hoping, you know, uh, as soon as this week, but uh, all right, so I'm just going to get straight into, uh, I'm gonna acknowledge one more time the presence of the senators who are here, Speaker William Barnes, thank you very much. Uh, Minority Leader, Senator Taitikui, my Vice Chair, Senator Sabina Paris, Senator Will Castro, thank you all. And so um, I have a couple questions. If, if, oh, Senator James Moylan, if I, if I can. And uh, okay, and so, if I could just ask a couple of questions. If we could just start with the, the military, since that was where we ended, uh, the Naval Hospital data. Are you, when you have your meetings, are you, are we able, I mean, we, we pretty much um, are just getting a number, but we're not able to tell how many of those are active or um, retirees versus um, any other factors that I just think would be relevant for our community. We know the retirees are very active in our community. I, I personally would like to know how they are being impacted by this, uh, you know, compared to the other populations on Guam. So um, what is the possibility of 
releasing that data? I mean, you are you are you privy to it? I guess if you could just clarify that one more time, Annette. We do get uh, summaries regarding are they contacts, are they veterans, retirees, dependents, are they dependents of the active duty service member or dependent of the retiree or veteran. Uh, we we have the, the, the snapshot from them. We do have brief case summaries that have been provided from Naval Hospital. Uh, and then that's where they reach out to us saying that based on their case investigation, they've identified civilian contacts. And so uh, that is some of the additional information that uh, Dr. Pobitsky was uh, mentioning in regards to further uh, details that they'll be providing on the weekly surveillance uh, separate from the SIPREP. So those are information that our team does communicate regularly with uh, the military on, on information and to, uh, besides age and ethnicity, um, that, that we can definitely try and add into the detailed report that is forthcoming, ma'am. Wonderful. Okay, good to hear. So we'll be added. That's great. And. Um, Okay, I'm gonna go back to the beginning, but uh, on the hiring, I'm so glad to hear of a lot of the progress that you have made. Thank you very much for all of the hard work. Um, as to the increased capacity of tracing uh, by bringing on additional personnel and, and partners in the community, have we met CDC guidelines for how many tracers we should have in our community for a population of this size? or an incidence level at this rate? We are actually in the process of hiring more. Uh, the ELC uh, COVID related grants, we have requested for 14 positions that are for investigators, uh, contact tracers. And so uh, the good news is uh, that we've been uh, doing profiling and doing the in-house GG1s. And so one, one, bot, uh, one individual, the first hire will be starting this upcoming Monday. Uh, we have seven under other individuals who are just waiting uh, for their uh, drug testing and to finish up their processing. So to help bring them on board. Uh, and so that would uh, definitely increase our capacity. Uh, and again, we're still using the same assumptions from June so that we are uh, consistent since with our containment and infection control brands that we're, we're operating on the same assumptions of uh, one contact, uh, one case investor, I apologize, trying to go back to doing a, a caseload of five. Uh, but when there's a surge, you're looking at one case investigator handling at least 15 cases, uh, you know, uh, and so that, and then to the contact tracers handling at least 25 contacts. Uh, we have instances where yes, the number is actually more, uh, but again, our staff are able to um, manage it by uh, thanks to the support of our leadership of bringing on uh, more personnel, as well as for our partners out in the community, public and private who are, are assisting us. We do have even two volunteers coming on their own time to help us. And so that again, continues to help with the workload. All right, so as of today, uh, do you have sufficient number available as of today to meet the need as of today? Uh, we are actually, uh, yes, ma'am, we've, we've added on this past week, thanks to my leadership uh, and the other divisions in our department. And so right now this is helping us to, to catch up on that backlog where we've decreased from being three to four days behind to two, at least two to three days now. Uh, and so the staff continue to work on that to, to do the catch up for that big surge that uh, you know, no one could have anticipated that large number that we had last month. All right, but we're anticipating that if we open up our economy, open up more businesses that, uh, you know, we, we will continue to have these uh, surges up and down. And can we, can we reduce that from two to three days? What is your goal? Um, and what are, what are we going to guarantee the public uh, when we open up the community, open up all the business? Our, our goal is to be back at how we were from the start, which is within 24 hours. Uh, that is the goal to be in line with CDC. And so with the, the large outcome from the UOG UCSF, that is another pool of contact tracers. There were approximately 85, and some of them came from other GovBomb agencies. And so uh, we've had initial discussions within my team that this would be a great opportunity to have those individuals trained from other agencies serve as the point of contact, and they can be the ones to conduct contact tracing within their agency. And of course, in coordination and communication with our public health team. And so again, the the expansion has gone beyond our department. And so with this uh, continued effort, the, the capacity will be there and, and that the, the support is there so that it's not just internal to public health, but we have our other 
sister agencies also being trained up, uh, having a designated two to three teams uh, like GPA and Port Authority of Guam. They took that initiative and they they helped us in the contact tracing. So that, that expansion is continuing. We plan to pilot with the University of Guam uh, where they will have their own uh, lead investigator over there to oversee a team of at least five but the goal is to expand that start with five and let's work the, uh, work out the process but to utilize all those 80 to 85 individuals who are trained um, uh, to to take advantage of them as a resource and to be ready should the next surge come in okay uh all right i just want to confirm that yeah we're not going to wait like a month for all of this and that yeah we're talking no, no. about a matter of days, right? Hopefully that you're going to get the UOG people on and 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 that we don't yeah. have to wait for the for an incident at GPA for the GPA people to help you if they're trained because I think we have all kinds of government employees available, willing and I'm sure they would volunteer in a heartbeat to help public health and I just I don't want to see us wait for this type of capacity when we have these people available. Mr. Chima. Yes, ma'am. I, I needed to chime in about what um, Annette just spoke on. I think um, we have to take a step back and look at the um, issue of containment around um, the, uh, the epidemic. I think the most important thing is con um, um, trying to uh, cut off infection at, at the point of testing, which is how um, the containment team actually supports contact tracing. Even if they have a day or two or three delay, if containment immediately goes into cut off transmission within the family, within the family, which is when you're using the concentric, concentric circle, that is where the high risk individuals are because that is where the individual spends more, more time. So what we try to do in the containment unit is try to limit our, our, our um, contact with the positive case within um, five to, to 24 hours. That way we're able to contain contain the, uh, the, the spread and the virus within the family within the family. And then it gives it gives the contact investigation team enough time to deploy and also gives them enough time to for the contact tracers to do more of a community uh, 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 more of a community uh, um, uh, investigation which is more widespread, but containing it, contain it, contain it in the family, which is most essential for us at that point of, of, uh, of um, testing and then um, getting a positive result. So with also the Sarah Alert system, we're going to support them with enough information from the family to be able to do their job. So it, it is a synchronized system between us and um, the surveillance unit to first of all mitigate by containing the virus within the family and the individual by successfully isolating the positive case, identifying close contacts, which most times are family members before we expand. So even if we extend within two to three days with this, with this, uh, uh, with this approach of containment, we'll be able to catch up with all our cases and also mitigate against the spread of the virus on the island. Okay, uh, Chima, you're talking about the Sarah app but when will that be implemented? We already have we already have the Guam response up, and right. then the, yes. So and um, by the twenty eighth um, by the twenty eighth of this month, we'll also have the traveler monitoring up. But we we already have the Guam response system up and running as of today. Right, but that's not what you're talking about by the Sara app, correct? That's something different. So the this is. For the travel. The, so the the, tra the travel app is when we open up the island a little more. Okay, so yeah. we're not ready with that. That's all I'm trying to clarify. You're we're not talking about that right now. That's not in place. Is that correct? The Guam response is in place right now. That is. Yes, but but what I'm trying to point out is that the containment unit approach of mitigation actually actually helps the contact investigation team by cutting off infection at the point of testing because we we speak to the individual who is the the index case and i properly isolate him at home and also quarantine his family members who are his closest contacts so by doing that the investigation team can buy time 
even if it's two days or one day, by knowing that the infection has been controlled within that family unit, why they extend to the community to engage with more contacts. All right, and that's ideal when you can do the five to 24 hour uh, notification of the positive case, right? Which is what we are doing right now. And it's, 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 we're doing it right now, but with increased number of cases, we're catching up within 24 hours too. Okay, there's been um, concerns in the community that uh, we're, we're mandating the positive person to be isolated uh, after they confirm positive, but the families are not um, necessarily isolated at the same time. Is that correct? Or the close contacts are not because we it takes us two to three days to, to inform all of the close contacts. So, so I, I think, ma'am, that is where we go back to uh, um, personal responsibility here. If an individual at the point of testing is notified that he is positive, they are also informed about going home to, uh, to inform their family members to stay quarantined until they are, uh, they are contacted by public health. Because, because at, the at, the, at, the point of at the point of testing, the individual is informed to isolate. And by isolating, they are going to keep away from their family members. And those family members automatically have been exposed to him. So those ones are quarantined at home at the same time. Okay. All right. Thank you. And so, um, Annette, one more time, we've got uh, 20 investigators, 24 tracers currently, and how many do you need to get to the 24 hours as a steady uh, 24 hours tracing? We're looking in, we're just backlogged maybe two or three days now, ma'am. So we're catching up um, with the personnel that we've, we've had now, we've increased over time. Um, and just in this uh, past week alone, the, the leadership has provided us additional staff. And so we anticipate catching up. We are now, instead of being three to four days behind, we're looking at only two to three days. Yes. And then we and have new personnel starting next week. So I'm sorry. All right. Okay. So once they uh, catch up, then you will be at 24 hours, hopefully on a consistent basis, right? Yes, and, and, and speaking back to what Chima had mentioned, uh, which is critical and that's definitely helped us is the process that we have internally so that the investigation may not have initiated, but the individual is aware that they are positive and that to stay home and separate from their family members and that those, those exposed family members are also aware that they are uh, contacts and they need to quarantine and, to, and they check on their symptoms. So that's, that, the, the, that is handing, being handled in tandem that Chima's team, which is very critical, is letting them know to stay home and separate while we initiate our investigation. Okay, all right. Um, we, um, I'm gonna have to move on. So I'm gonna, I want to concentrate a little bit uh, before I let my colleagues ask questions after me is just on this AG's opinion. Is the AG specifically saying that the Department of Public Health cannot name actual establishments or organizations where the clusters may occur or be occurring? And, um, is that what they're saying? All right, I know you're going to issue guidance soon, but if you've already have that in front of you, what it, yeah, what is it prohibiting? What's prohibited? Um, Senator, Chair, Chair, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Terlahi, my apologies. Let me get that right. Uh, it's uh, the response is that they recommend it be tied to a function of the agency, such as trying to identify individuals that have been at these establishments for contact tracing purposes. So. Identifying an establishment would be related to our work in contact tracing. And it wouldn't be just, uh, you know, for just to announce it, but it would be related to the work of contact tracing. So that's just a guide. We just want to write this up so that it'll be our guideline or protocol whenever uh, anyone is asked the question and make sure it meets the criteria and then we can disclose that. All right. That means uh, if I can just say it in layman's terms that uh, if I went to an event where there were over 50 people and the person, not everyone there knows me, they wouldn't be able to tell you that I was there. So they would have to tell you, I went to this event. Hopefully you could announce the event and I could voluntarily say, uh oh, you know, maybe I was at risk and maybe I should, you know, do something else now. But, um, or we can learn that there were just five cases from certain activities such as, uh, you know, running on the beach. I don't know, but you know, you, I'm I'm sure you're going to say there were other activities such as, uh, you know, going to church at a certain place or whatever, because uh, 
then I would change my behavior to, to meet, you know, where the higher risk lies. And isn't that what we want to do for the community? Is that still the goal that we want them to know what type of behavior is higher risk? And, and what part of this uh, informs our decisions or the, you know, the governor's decisions to make, uh, you know, make the orders. So if we're banning, you know, indoor activity at restaurants, yeah, we need to see the data that says all, you know, because there were 25 cases from restaurants and that's not been very clear, I think, or consistent. It's mm. not been very consistent. And the restaurant yeah. owners deny that, of course. So I don't know, are you able, yeah, to release that type of activity? So we know going to bars, when they say, they've said kind of on the side that going to bars is what has brought up some of these cases, but we don't see that in the actual data anywhere, right? That it was actually bar usage or funeral. That's not in our reach, but perhaps it's in yours. And I'm, I'm wondering those kind of activities are, are what uh, uh, Anne Pabatsky was saying is going to be included then. I, uh, Chairman, I believe it is. And um, one of the things you, you mentioned, Chair, Chairwoman, is in regards to you know modifying behavior. So the launching of the exposure notification is really something in line with what you are saying this afternoon because if someone is um, on the system, you sign up and then you come into contact or you are exposed rather to someone who is positive, you'll get that notification. And then of course it provides you guidance as to staying at home and monitoring your systems and seeking medical, medical attention if you need to. Um, but yes, yeah, so I can. I will continue to working with our team and like Dr. Ann and uh, we work on perhaps providing information to the community in terms of where these, these uh, clusters are at. Um, I know that in some areas, we've seen some data that it's really already in the community, but we can definitely look at what else we can provide for the public information. And, and you're right, we have some of the data that has not been um, disclosed completely. Uh, for no other reason than it's being worked on and needs to be refined to make sure that we present that information accurately. Yeah, my, and my other concern is whether that data is what's being used to make the rules, you know what I mean, or or is not, it? or are we just making random rules not based on the data, so also that, and so I will appreciate this one, this weekly uh, letting out of the data, I think that that, that will help, and, and uh, we, we will finesse it as we go along, but I, I Art, uh, as the director, you are the public health authority for this yes, public health emergency. Mm -hmm. Do does your data at your department help drive the decision making as to you know what activities are high risk or not? Yes, uh, so the data and it's combined with our data and the data presented by the physicians advisory group chairman chairwoman. And so what we looked at recently was the number of hospitalizations, uh, the number of deaths. And so we look at that type of data also in looking at what would be our next step for the community. And then, of course, the data that we have, it's in the SIPREF. And so our SIPREF also works with the data that's used by the Physicians Advisory Group, primarily led by Dr. Cabrera in terms of his data presentation. Right. So he's able to show us the data, like when we reach our capacity at the hospital, you know, uh, that with this type, you know, with continued acceleration, when we will be reaching our capacities. But, but specifically, the data that drives which activities are high risk. I think can only come from public health because you are the ones who are tracing and investigating. You know where the contacts are, are connected or where they went and where where the risk might lie. I don't know, that's my understanding, but okay, I'm gonna uh, open it up for my colleagues, uh, beginning with the Vice Chair, uh, Senator Sabina Paris. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you to everybody at the Department of Public Health and Social Services for all your hard work. Um, yeah, we really appreciate that. Um, so I just was listening in on the conversation earlier regarding um, the, the amounts of funding towards uh, testing. And um, so earlier it was stated, I believe, um, I think it was Tommy Taitigui was stating that 313,000 was uh, supposed to be set aside for the testing, but then it was used for the quarantine facilities. Um, so I'm just uh, interested to, to know uh, what is the projection for the amount um, that is needed for uh, a sustained contact tracing and testing of the community, um, considering we're in the long haul or in it for the long haul? Uh, are there projections? And um, just to make sure that we have 
uh, money uh, set aside for the future. With with what's been granted f for, uh, for us, right, in in mm -hmm. the area, in the uh, in the area of uh, testing and, and contact tracing, uh, we 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 were provided seven point three million, and of that seven point three million, we still have six point three million remaining. So that should provide us through. Uh, 2022. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the other thing is, what are your thoughts about mass testing like frontliners in addition to the contact tracing? Um, I guess this question could be for Chima or uh, any others. Oh, and Anne, yes, thank you, Anne. Senator Paris, sorry, this is Annette again. Uh, yes, we, uh, the frontliners, be it healthcare workers, our law enforcement, uh, critical infrastructure, they are a priority group. And so now uh, focusing back on our targeted testing, they are part of our uh, state testing plan that we had to submit to CDC when we applied for the enhanced detection grant, the one that is $5.6 million. And so we are, we are, uh, supposed to target 2% of Guam's population every month. We've actually been exceeding it uh, for the past few months. And so, yes, we have priority uh, for frontline, even for congregate setting, we're looking at like the skilled nursing unit, the long-term care facility, St. Dominic's, uh, DOC as well, uh, DYA. And so th those areas are part of our state testing plan. And we have been fortunate that CDC uh, has extended uh, the free test kits until the end of December. And so that's why we have not spent down as much because we have earmarked money to buy test kits, but we have been granted, uh, all jurisdictions have been granted to continue to order free test kits through CDC until the end of December. Uh, WHO as well has provided thousands of test kits to the US API islands. And so uh, we, we received uh, uh, several sh shipments from them, but CDC will continue all the way until the end of December, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Annette. Um, another question that I have is, so what is the limiting factor? Is it the investigators or is it the testing capacity in regards to contact tracing at this point? It was a, a domino effect of ha having the large number of uh, turnout from the August 15th event where we had 14 hour, 1400 in one day, in addition to other tests that were, or other swabs, I apologize, that were uh, collected through like our private and uh, public healthcare providers. So that turned into having a backlog for testing to tell us who were positive, which then uh, backlogged into to the initiation of uh, case investigation and contact tracing. The backlog for laboratory testing has been uh, taken care of. And so now the delayed testing and the results coming out is what now our case investigators our cont and contact tracers have been dealing with. And so again, uh, the backlog of three to four days, we are now pushing it down. We're reducing it to two to three days, ma'am, and we continue to work on that. So we can go back to the goal of within 24 hours. Okay, thank you. Um, the other uh, in thing that I'm interested in is as far as the strains, is anybody keeping tabs on what type of strain is coming into Guam? Um, is that being monitored? We unfortunately have not done the, the gene coding, um, but there have been the reports that I know our medical director as well as us have been monitoring in regards to the reports coming out of, uh, there's a slight shift in a strain that where a man was reinfected recently and that was Hong Kong. Uh, just the other month that information came out. And so that is something of concern that we will continue to monitor, uh, look to CDC and WHO for that information, uh, especially as how that will impact the vaccine that is currently being developed uh, for the first strain. So that is something that we have to monitor and, and it's of concern, should it be, should these viruses be able to shift or drift similar to like this, the influenza? And that's why it's a seasonal uh, vaccination uh, versus other va um, vaccine preventable diseases that are more stable and that you could be immunized for years and be, be, uh, be fine. So that again, we continue to monitor uh, and we will follow CDC guidance uh, be, as a U.S. territory, we have to comply with U.S. FDA and U.S. CDC approved vaccines. Uh, and based on that, um, based on their monitoring and guidance, if they see that there's a shift, how how effective will the vaccine they've created be and whether they need to um, 
develop a, a different vaccine. But again, we're looking forward to the first vaccine to come out in the next few months. So as far as the testing that's taking place is uh, like a duplicate sample set aside and sent to a reference laboratory uh, to test strains currently? Is that happening right now? At this time, no, we do have uh, plans though to do serology testing and that's for uh, to see anyone who's uh, previously had uh, COVID and uh, to check for antibodies. But at this point in time, we're not doing a uh, submission to CDC or other labs for like testing, gene coding. Okay. So the serology, is that sufficient to capture the that information? Serology will just let us, let, let us know, ma'am, if the person had an infection with COVID. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's to see to, uh, there is a uh, proposal to do a study between the Department of Public Health and University of Guam uh, that over the next two years to do a serology testing to see, because again, a lot is not known whether the immunity and how long it, it, it really does last because it's a, a novel virus. And so there's still much to be learned and, and that, that research will help us see how many, the pop, percent of population on Guam who uh, had COVID and then we can go from there. Matt. Senator Perez, if I could, if I could ask the director to uh, just, uh, if he could report to the legislature as to who on Guam is responsible for obtaining the different uh, strains of the virus or monitoring that and just uh, send to us maybe in writing a plan or what the plan is or whose responsibility that is so that we can do some follow up on that. I don't think, uh, uh, if it's okay with you, Senator Perez, we, we, I don't think we should continue with that line of questioning right now. I'll, uh, I've asked them to just concentrate on tracing the tracing of, of the contacts for tonight and the investigation of those positive cases. So appreciate yeah. it. But you, you, if you have any other questions, Senator Perez? Yes, th yeah, thank you for that. I do appreciate that follow-up. Um, the other thing I guess uh, would be environmental health. So um, I can ask that question offline since it's not directly related, but I was just thinking more prevention, You know, combining the contact tracing with more preventative measures um, that's something I would like to follow up later too as well. Oh, so please, thank you. Please, please ask that because uh, we've got Mr. Nadeau here and I, I, and he talked about the role of the, the environmental health with the tracing. Yeah, it's all goes hand in hand. Okay, yeah. So um, yeah, Mr. Nadeau, if you can speak to uh, the, the tandem efforts to for pre preventative measures uh, to kind of help uh, quell the, the, you know, the, the spread or prevent the spread. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Yes. Several weeks ago, this very discussion was brought out with the contact tracing team. And so we agreed that they would be sharing data uh, specifically from their end. So we, uh, so we have better understanding where the, the, uh, the infections are occurring so we can focus our resources where necessary, uh, whether it be like a funeral, as they mentioned, or a bar, or, or wherever there's the, the, the outbreaks occurring or where the spikes are, if you will. So yes, we do communicate and uh, we we're just simply seek their uh, data to allow us to drive our resources to the right direction. Okay. Um, okay, great. Well, we're looking forward to hearing more about that. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. If I could just add, so, and Mr. Nadeau heads the Division of Environmental Health. They are the ones who go out and do the inspections, but they all, I've also been the ones who are writing up the guidelines or approving the guidelines for the opening of certain classes of businesses. So yes, we're looking forward that the data matches, right? Like when you say you should uh, only have 50% capacity, that that's because of the data that you're seeing or from the other side of public health. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, no problem. Uh, if I may also, Madam Chair, uh, yes. the, the guidance I actually work collaboratively with all the, our partners uh, within the department and also our stakeholders outside. So it's not just the Division of Robert Health decision. It's just I'd like to share that with you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes, I know the, the businesses themselves are supposed to be writing them up and submitting them. Okay, great. So thank you to all of public health. And I'll ask for the uh, minority leader, Senator Taidu. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, Dr. Kaneshiro, you mentioned earlier about the Bureau of Emergency, uh, a new uh, section of the Bureau. Is that going to be working toward also contract tracing? Are you going to just move that whole entity to this Bureau, or uh, and how soon are you plan to uh, bring it up, have it working? Actually, actually, we're creating a new Bureau with new people. We're not, we're not, we're not um, moving existing employees into the Bureau. We're actually hiring new people to create the Bureau and we're using the ELC grant to fund that. 
So, so there's about 26 positions in the ELC grant that's available. And so we're going to put those positions into this bureau. So what this bureau is going to be doing is, so in times of emergencies, they're ready to go to do contact tracing. There's going to be lab in there. There's nurses. So it's, it's, it's like a self-contained bureau on its own for in time of emergency. emergency. Okay. So that, I'm sorry, uh, director, did you want to say something? Yes, actually, it's the Bureau of Emerging Infectious Diseases, and as Dr. Kenny Shiro said, it is a part of the ELC grant. So some of the individuals that are going to be hired in the coming weeks and months under ELC will be actually positioned for this. We're also working with the CDC Foundation to onboard some folks, and the plan is that those folks on onboard will be then also part of the uh, Bureau of uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases. And so we're looking at not just today, we're looking at tomorrow. We have the Bureau of Communicable Disease Control. They have case investigators and contact tracers, and they're trained up. But we also want another Bureau of Emerging Infectious Diseases so that we have more capacity within the department. So if there's a need for us to move staff who are already trained and we're prepared, we have more staff that can do that kind of work in in hopes that we will be able to also do just-in-time training for other members in the community if we need to so that we can stay with the CDC guidelines like doing case investigations and contact tracing in a more timely manner. So we're looking at how things are looking today, how we need to build capacity, but we got to build it in, in-house as well so that in the future we, we have reach back via BCDC or Bureau of Emerging Infectious Diseases and that was something that Dr. Kenishiro and I and some other individuals have been talking about within here in the department. And we're, we're looking at that as a, as a potential way to prepare, not just for, and, and respond to today, but also in the future. So we wanted to share one, that's one of our planning initiatives. So Arthur, did you mention that when, when you hope to have it up and, and running and have people in place, did, did you give it a timeline? A timeline, no, we don't have a timeline. We have the funding and then, it's a matter of putting the, I'm not sure how far they are with the recruitment packets, but it's sitting down and, and just firming things up, ensuring that we're ready to move, to move forward with the ELC grant and the funding that comes with it. Uh, because we're still gonna need to hire staff as well. Can you give me like a, a goal, that, a date, you know, a goal that you're looking for, you're shooting for to have it up and running? You know, um, it would be great to say we could do it in six to nine months. I, I really don't want to commit to that because it doesn't involve just public health and social services. It in involves working with the Department of Administration to get these people on board. And they do the work they do, but sometimes, and I'm sure many of the senators here this afternoon, this evening know this, sometimes it takes nine months just to fill a position. Now, if we went with a limited term and temporary appointments, we might be able to get them on board sooner than later. So that would be our challenge, Senator, is that we're, we're looking not just for LTAs and TAs, LTAs and TAs fill a gap, but in the height of, for example, a surge, we may have to terminate an LTA or a TA depending on their six months or 12 months. So just when you need them the most, it might be, oh, they're, they're having to be terminated because their, their temporary appointment is coming to uh, an end. So we're really wanting to plan this out well so we don't find ourselves in that predicament. You know, that, you that, oh, thank you, Arthur. And, and that leads me to my next question with regards to the, the assistance that you, you receive from CDC. And I don't know how much assistance you receive from the U.S. Department of Public Health um, with regards to this pandemic. And I know um, I, there were test kits that were, were given to you, if I'm not mistaken. But has public health um, asked for any uh, personnel uh, like the hospital, uh, receiving personnel like nurses and doctors, has um, public health gone that route to ask for, you know, individuals to come and yes, assist? We, we, yes, we are working on that request at this time, Senator. Uh, we're articulating our needs, and so, I'm, but I'm in communications already with CDC, and we're talking about the positions, for the frequency, the period, how many hours, and what types of positions we'll need, and then we'll be submitting that uh, for a request. Okay, that's good to hear because uh, we can get whatever we can right now. And, and if you don't ask, we don't get. So um, the other one, uh, just a couple more. Um, there Has there been any recent deliveries of testing machines um, to uh, clinics in, in the last week? Has there been a surge of these machines given to clinics? 
We're, I'm not, I, Dr. Key, I know manages the, with Anne, Anne Marie, our Ministry for the Lab, the uh, Abbott ID in terms of the distribution. I, I'm not sure you may have gotten wind of uh, information that uh, we are going to be receiving additional Abbott ID now machines, but I, I, and I'm not sure, I don't believe they're here yet, but they might have been since my last update. I don't know, is Anne still with us, Anne Marie? Have we received the 15 Abbott's ID already? Yes, hi, Director. Um, just this afternoon, okay. we received um, ID Now instruments. Uh, quantity is 14. Oh, 14, okay. 14. Yeah. Yes. And, so, just to and Marie, can you turn your video on, please? Uh, if oh, it's uh, start my video. So um, okay. I know there was a request for 15 and we have 14. Uh, I'm not sure. Will we be getting uh, another machine, Anne-Marie, or is that all they were able to give us at this time? Um, so I think we were, yeah, we were expecting 15, but I'm going to clarify with Dr. Cato right. and uh, CDC on, on, on this um, getting 14 only today. Mm. So I'll follow up with them. Okay. So I don't know, Dr. I mean, Senator uh, Tyler, I don't know if that's what you're speaking of, but uh, Dr. Kenishiro, have we, or you and Anne, have you issued anything this week for Abbott ID? It was just no. the second, it was just the second um, Abbott we gave AMC last week. So that wasn't this week though, right? No, nothing, no. no. Yeah, yeah, no, nothing this week, Senator. Okay, thank you so much. And my last question, I don't know if it was asked already, um, with regards to mass testing again, are you going to start that up again in the villages? And Well, let, let me say this. What we're doing is we, we're looking at how the COVID, Guam COVID alert application works. So we're wanting to see will we have an influx of calls or requests for testing. But if things go as in other places, there wasn't an influx, but we have positioned ourselves with additional staff for the 311 line, just in the event there is an influx. And if there is not an influx, we are looking to doing controlled community testing in a village, like we did in Talapopo. And so people will again pre-register and so that we can manage that. The goal here is that we will do community testing, but we also will do timely test uh, notification and then we also don't overwhelm our lab. And then we find ourselves back to where we were some weeks ago where individuals are saying it's been four or five days, I haven't gotten my tests, I'm even longer than that. And so we wanna be sure we get that notification out sooner than later. And also so the lab can manage that properly. One of the things that happens on a Saturday testing is of course is the request for the lab staff to work on Sunday. And so we also wanna be able to have them be available to do that so that there's not a backlog because specimens are also collected from other, other lab, uh, clinics and sent to our laboratory. So Arthur, when, when are you expecting that? How soon can uh, that begin again? Because you know, there's a lot of constituents who want to find a place to, to get tested. And uh, with this surge that's coming up, you know, with all these people being infected, it's, it's scary. So um, they want to know. And of course, I have people texting me, you know, saying, when is the next one? When is the next mass one? So can you give a, a roundabout figure of Probably, if, if, if there's anything this week, went, it's probably going to be the latter part of the month, but it's, it's the target village this coming time is going to be Yamada. And not just because uh, it's target, but also because of all the villages on Guam, that is the one single village we have not provided any community testing to. So we want to walk away, at least in terms of mass community testing, that we've given that opportunity to all the villages on island. Right? So we're working with um, the mayor down. Well, Dr. Dr. Kenishiro and her team is, is working closely, I believe, with Mayor Kanata. And so um, that's our plan for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank yes, Senator and, and Director. If I could just add, I know that the, tonight we weren't supposed to focus on testing. We could probably take a whole night just to talk about that because I think the health has changed a little bit, their strategy going forward with testing because of the high incidences in the community, if I understand correctly, you're going to continue, I mean, you need to take care of testing those contacts first, right? right? That's the priority. Right, yeah. But they do have a grant, Senator Tideway, I just wanna make sure every all the senators are also aware that they have a grant for community testing. So they will always do community testing while they have this grant. So that's part of their strategy, but it's, it's not the immediate uh, containment strategy that they're also working on to to stop this, this spike that we're having. Do I, did I, 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 
Yeah, okay. you're very you're very much on target, Chair Chairwoman. Uh, the Honorable Macy uh, Chair, uh, one of the things we're doing, and, and this is why it's so critical, is because we do have close contacts that need to get tested. So what we also do, when we get telephoto in, in a control situation, which has worked out really well for all everyone, we also still maintain the operations of the Northern Regional Community Health Center. So that way we can still have testing there as well. So we didn't close the north and just focus down in Talapopo. Both were open at the same time. So we had testing down in Talapopo, testing continued at the Northern Health Center. And that's something that in working with Dr. K and you know, just the rest of our public health and social service team, we're like, hey, we gotta do this, but we can't stop the close contact uh, testing because it sets it back. So we can't do any of that. So we've been really, really um, sitting at the table and really looking at what, what would be the best approach. And we believe that today, this is the best strategy that we can use. And it's proven itself so far in one event. All right. Can I just add then the 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 test uh, or the the testing capacity that has been distributed to some of the private clinics is to assist you in this regard. So close contacts can go and be tested at Northern, or they can be tested at these clinics because that's why we're that's why public health is distributing it with the help of CDC. And that's where your question regarding help from CDC it's really come in in the lab capacity, is that correct? They, they are really helping Guam to, to expand lab capacity. So a uh, testing, sorry, testing capacity. Yeah, and lab capacity. Our, um, thank you, Senator Taitikui. I'm going to um, um, move on to Senator Castro right now, and then Senator uh, Moylan right after that. Thank you, Madam Chair Hoffaday uh, to the DPHSS team. Thank you so much for all the good work you do. Um, I want to commend you for being open-minded and working with the stakeholders on new ideas. One of your uh, professional staff referenced that it is the novel corona, uh, coronavirus. And so I just want to reinforce, Madam Chair, the, the importance of the use of data. Uh, as far back as April 13th of this year, I've been, I, I believe I sent a letter to the governor and other officials uh, encouraging us to look at refining that data, making uh, greater use of that specific information uh, not necessarily names, but things like, uh, and I put it in the main chat there in case I had to, in, in case I had some connectivity issues. And uh, I think the Surgeon Cell also acknowledged that they're looking in that direction. They may even be exploring it, Director or Dr. Kaneshiro, in terms of looking at, uh, I don't know, statistical software packages that could cross-tabulate and help us have a better understanding of what the frequency is among certain types of demographics, right? Whether it's an age or occupation, uh, where you live uh, may not be a factor, and I, I'm not a scientist, but may not be the ultimate determining factor, uh, may not be as high of a factor as uh, where you work. And I also reference that I know two people who acquired COVID in addition to myself, and they both worked behind the fence and in, in relatively similar occupations. And I guess my point would be as we're becoming uh, more knowledgeable and learned about the virus and adopting more sophisticated uses of technologies, different types, I just want to go back to the basics and encourage us to do two things. One, uh, make much more meaningful use of this information as it becomes available. Uh, work with the university if the internal capacity is not there. I know public health, um, I, actually, I don't know if you have a statistician, but I want to encourage you to partner with the right people to do that. The second thing I want to put back on the table that, that I believe would really help us is working with our community leaders. Uh, back in April, the the pandemic was fresh, right? It was just here. We we're just trying to understand what was going on. But I'll tell you who knows their people best. Coaches, spiritual leaders at the churches, uh, heads of family and other types of folks who are exposed to certain people who they influence, teachers and, and schools. And so I guess my point would be, you know, that if we can um, get as much information out there and make use of it and get it into the hands of those who have direct access to these folks and influence behavior as one of the other doctors, uh, I'm sorry, member of your staff, uh, I quoted him. Shima, I'm sorry, forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, but, but you mentioned something very important to me about two Fridays back. And you mentioned that ultimately containment of the virus is gonna require a change in human behavior, individual human behavior in order that we can experience and realize a change in community behavior. And I, I really believe that. And one of the things uh, we can do to get people to respond to that call to action is to arm them with data, to let them know as an example that it's occurring more and more in these areas with these occupations at this point in time. And so I just wanna put that back on the table and thank you all of you. You know, um, having worked uh, 
in academic circles before, people are very reticent about taking in new ideas. But I thank you, Director, and especially a lot of you folks have been in there for decades for opening your minds and helping us deal with this pandemic because it's, it's, it's affecting everybody. It's, gonna affect, it's affected lives. We know people who've died from this as recent as this morning. And, it's, and ultimately, it's affecting livelihood. So I thank you, Chair, for being diligent. I, I know it's it's rough for all of us to have to report in after a certain time. I got my family waiting for me. I'm sure I missed dinner, but but I thank you. It's an investment worth uh, making. Thank you so much again. And that those are my two pieces of my two contributions, Madam Chair, uh, to the concept of contact tracing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Castro. Senator Moylan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first question is for uh, ASO. Mr. Tidegui, uh, just to reiterate, I believe he said that we have 22 million of federal agency uh, monies available for contact tracing. Just to confirm that, please. Yes, uh, the, you're, you are correct. Okay. The, uh, a lot of these grants that were awarded were awarded specifically for the different, the various programs that we administer. These programs include like programs for the aging. We have programs for childcare development. Uh, child welfare services, and then. Uh, yeah. So, so you're saying it's it's shared with those programs. It's just not specifically for contact tracing. It was awarded to for those programs, not 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 specifically for for contract tracing or, or investigations or. Okay, okay, I appreciate that. Okay, but but there is money to hire what the department wants. Uh, to develop their own team, that's through the ELC uh, monies available then for contact, yes. right? In, in the meantime, and laboratory capacity. Okay, and in the meantime, we do have these contract tracers that are, are not part of the department or coming from other agencies, but are these current contact tracers paid? I, I'm gonna assume they are through their agencies, through their funding agencies. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's not in additional monies that through the federal CARES Act, if it came from CARES Act, it would come from their agencies, but, but actually there's still employees who are volunteering to do this uh, contact tracing within their departments and to assist uh, department of uh, DP department of public health with the other contact tracing necessary for the public. Is that, is that how that's working? Uh, yes. Okay. Are, are we looking at hiring? contract tracers because eventually, but I know what the director was explaining that it's gonna take some time. But are, in the meantime, are we looking at hiring uh, other other people to to assist? Ms. Elkin might be better able to answer that for me. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. So, thank you, uh, Tommy, and thank you, Senator Moylan. Currently, we are utilizing uh, other uh, Bureau of Communicable Disease Control Investigators Coordinators uh, that are federally funded and we have approval uh, through our grantors uh, to, to be temporarily reassigned or they've expanded the capacity within our existing grant funding to allow for assistance with COVID-19 response. In regards to the Epidemiology Laboratory Capacity COVID grants, we have budgeted over two point over $2 million for personnel. Uh, we're looking at a minimum of 14 LTA positions and these are for the investigators, uh, contact tracers, coordinators uh, that will handle COVID specifically. Um, and so that, that will be added onto our um, workforce. And then with the CDC foundation, uh, we were looking at only two, uh, they call them disease investigation specialists. Uh, they can be investigators as well, as, as well as contact tracers. And so actually we've already interviewed uh, two, we've selected them. And so we hope to get them on board as quickly as possible. But our, our ELC funded positions, one is actually starting this Monday and we have seven uh, being processed and just waiting for the drug testing and to get them on board uh, to help uh, further augment um, our investigation and contact tracing unit. The ELC positions as the uh, full-time positions within the Department of Public Health to build that team that you want for what other diseases that may come come our way, right? Okay. Yes, yes sir. Uh, so that the 14, the limited term 14, those aren't the ELC positions? Yes, sir. They, they are. The they are, ELC. yes, sir. Oh, okay. We're not, we, we haven't hired somebody else in the meantime and on this side and no, okay. No, the, the, Correct. The other 
assistance we're getting from other agencies, like from DYA, they have temporarily uh, assigned them over to us. So their department, while well, like in PCOR 1, so they shifted them over to us to assist us in the surge uh, response. And so they, they are being paid through their agency. Uh, okay. And then, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Um, for Mr. Uh, for Director St. Augustine, so, you know, you mentioned the the time that it needs to get hired, maybe that's something we can work uh, together with DOA to try to get rid of some of this red tape to help expedite because it, it's uh, it's time time importance. But but thank you for that. And uh, director, I'll, I'll give you a call out, offline, maybe the, um, maybe next week here, and we can talk some more on how I can help you out on that one. Um, right. Next, thank question, you, thank you're welcome. The next question is for Chima. You know, you mentioned the the two programs that we already have. I'm wondering if any of this overlaps with the new program of the Guam Response app. Are these two programs with the Emoka and the uh, Sarah Lot? Would that conflict with the Guam Response app? Is it double work or? No, sir. No, sir. It's completely different. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question I have for Ann uh, Pobutsky, please. You know, the. Um, we understand that the COVID-19 reacts or the, the deaths has been due, uh, due to comorbidities. And I'm wondering on the, on the report that you're revising on the uh, dashboard without, of course, the, you know, following the guidelines there, but will we be able to also identify those comorbidities uh, as, that is the cause of death? Would that be included in the report? Yes, that is correct. Not just for deaths, of which 100% had one or more comorbidities. I looked at that data today. And for the other cases where we see um, just the positive cases, yes, that is one of the plans for the weekly surveillance report. Okay, that would be very helpful. Thank, thank you very much. Um, another question for you, Anne, uh, is that you know, I see these private businesses and, you know, they come forward and they say, oh, we had an employee. Uh, we're going to close down for a day. We're going to fumigate and what we had to do, make sure all our other employees are fine. And then they open the next day. Um, my question will be for government of Guam agencies. Um, can we expect that kind of uh, turnaround time? You know, it's, it's bound to happen, like in the Guam legislature, for example. Um, we were told we couldn't go back to the Congress building for two weeks because we had to shut down because of public health's direction. But yet in the private sector, uh, they're back in business when it wasn't PCOR 1, but when it was back at PCOR 3 and they, somebody was uh, identified as a COVID carrier there. So my, my question is, does public health establish those rules for the businesses? Is, is it separate for government agencies, or can we see a, a just about a quick enough a turnaround time that like the private, uh, there's a positive case, they clean it up, disinfect, they're open for business, but Gulf Guam, we're, we're closed for much longer. Can you explain that please? I don't know if I have the, the right answer for that, why Gulf Guam might be closed for two weeks because of one person. It might be that there were more there was there was more than one person at a particular agency. I don't know the specifics, but um, this is related to another question earlier about uh, establishments being the issue. Again, we're going back to people's behavior is the issue. We've had uh, we had a case where there was a hardware franchise where one person was uh, identified as positive, and then they shut down and they cleaned the place up and. If the person who is identified as positive is isolated, then there's there's no worry about everybody else if nobody else got sick. And I think Chima might be able to answer this question better than I could. So this is related to the issue of what becomes the risk. The risk that we've seen, particularly during the surge, is large gatherings. We actually have not had a specific restaurant um, that was just having takeout in small groups. There was one restaurant associated with a large gathering that had a number of cases that was a cluster. So it's not the establishment per se, it's the uh, behavior of the people. So I really don't know who establishes those rules. That might be uh, Chima or Annette who might be able to answer that specifically about why Gov Guam is closed for two weeks, but businesses are allowed to open after they clean up. Yeah. And, and 
Nat, please. Thank you. It, Thank you, Anne. Yes, sir. Uh, in the course of the investigation, um, a lot of these businesses have shifts and rotations. So the infected individual is in, in, in one shift only. It doesn't impact their operation. So those close contacts within that shift, because again, are in the, the front of the house or the, they're in the back kitchen. Uh, we have to we have to look at all those factors and whether you as a, op, as a business can still operate if we, we remove so many of your uh, employees who are identified as contacts. Unfortunately for public health, we're all normally in the same office. We're all eight to five or even longer. And so unfortunately your exposure, you have exposed everyone in your office and you, you unfortunately have to shut down and send them home because now you're all quarantined for the 14 days from your last exposure. Um, in regards to shutting down and disinfecting, the guidance has been put out there. Uh, Tom with DH has been, uh, you know, that submitted so much guidance and provided support and guidance to businesses. But with CDC recommendation, it's you wait 24 hours before you sanitize and disinfect a, a, an affected area where the cases were at. And this even applies to schools. Um, if you can't wait for 24 hours, you wait as long as possible. But once you sanitize and you disinfect using US EPA approved chemicals and uh, disinfectants, you can reopen and use those spaces. Yeah. So it's just and, a matter of the exposure. Yeah, for example, you, you have a good example, but um, let's use DRT for example, right? And somebody is exposed there. Are, are we saying that uh, you can expect DRT to be closed for two weeks until you go through everybody there or, or, or not? If the infected case went through all those units, you could uh, look at looking at a section. Uh, and again, it's, it's the makeup because inside uh, they're a big area and, and Chima too is definitely would give the guidance on, on the containment infection control bar, part. But again, our close contact definition follows CDC uh, within six feet, 15 minutes. And then again, we're people following the guidance that's been put out from the start, uh, wearing your mask, staying home if you're sick. And so again, we work from the center outward and see how far the possible exposure was and how how many different offices and units that need to to close okay. down and 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 be uh, quarantined for the 14 days okay i appreciate that uh, a separate question for you how many more kits do we have available for testing is, i don't know if kits is the right word the swaps we have three well we have three different testing platforms sir so we have over 16,000 kits total uh, that's within Guam Public Health alone, but we do receive a shipment almost every two weeks, and that's the free ones that we get, like through CDC. So we have a combination uh, for the ABI, the Gene Expert, and the Abbott ID machine. It's over sixteen thousand currently on stock. We're, we're in stock. Okay, that that's great. Uh, final question, uh, Madam Chair, for Mr. Nado there, uh, regarding when you go out and uh, um, and do your investigation there. It, you know when we. When we shut down, we shut down completely, but there are other private companies that have been uh, working hard to ensure and follow the guidelines, but we shut them down as well. I'm just wondering, if, um, as we learn through our process here, can we keep those that are following the guidelines open and just shut down those that, that violate? W would that be a recommendation you think you can do uh, working up the chain of command so that we can help the small businesses? Well, we're open to any and all suggestions and recommendations, Senator. So that's something definitely we could take up to the during the discussion in creating the guidance document. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, thank Madam you. Chair, thank you very much. And Mr. Director, I'll be contacting you and see how we can uh, expedite this process of the hiring so we can get those contractors, con contact tracers on board for you. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Senator Moreland. And, um, Again, to all of you, a lot of progress, and I'm, I'm looking forward to even more in the ones that you've described are upcoming. So very excited about that. It can't come sooner. I know the whole, all of the businesses are clamoring for this data. They want our, our closures to be data-driven, risk-driven. Uh, and I think the public, you know, if, if it makes sense to them, they will do it. And, and the, the challenge as, for me as a leader, I'm having is to make everything, you know, explain in ways that it makes sense to everyone that, uh, um, you know, why certain businesses are closed, why certain ones are open. And so we're looking to public health. You're the ones who are doing the contact tracing. You are the ones who know who are the positive cases. How did they get it? You, you know that information. And we want all of our lockdowns to be based on solid information. 
And so the more you share it with the public, I think the more they will understand and they will be able to, as I always say, come along, you know, we all want to be on the same page and this is very important. So, and I want to congratulate you for all the work that you've done. There's still a lot of work. I can hear it and uh, can't get those additional employees fast enough or get the additional help fast enough. I, I'm all for moving the other government of Guam employees that are working from home and putting them on this, if this is the priority right now and, and reduce the backlog. And uh, let's get up to our 24 hours, uh, you know, ideal. Let's get to the ideal in, in, as, uh, over the weekend if we can. So next week, that's what we're looking for. I'm, I'm very happy about that. But, but really it's, it's just these, these lockdowns are, are killing our economy. And, uh, but, you know, of course we need to take care of our hospital but we want the data, so we want it to drive, you know, what the risks are. So we, we just want your help to make that information available, make it very clear to the public, uh, you know, what might might be risk factors uh, to, to getting the COVID. And again, congratulations on the release of your app today. And while we're here, I'm sure all of the senators here agree with me. And we want to encourage the community to please sign on to this app. We have been assured by Google and Apple, Department of Health, our governor, and more importantly, these experts in, in the nonprofit foundations, in MIT, our local uh, computer programming experts, that they have done all they can to protect privacy. But this app is not going to be effective for Guam unless we can get 60% of our population to sign on. It's a preventative app. You have to be signed on before you get tested positive or it's not gonna work. You have to get signed on now. We want everyone to sign on in the next, in the next seven days. And uh, if you're signed on, then if you're exposed, we can protect you or we can protect every, everyone else. But if you're not signed on before you're exposed, it's not going to be as effective. So please, we want everyone to sign on in advance. And I hope I've also described that properly. But uh, again, so thank you to all of you. And we are going to uh, thank you for the hours and hours of work. And I can't thank you enough uh, on behalf of the entire community. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on now to the second item on our agenda. And I'm, I'm sorry about the time, but uh, we're going to, this is going to now be the executive appointment of Mr. Arthur Yu and Augustine to serve as the director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. So Art has been acting as the acting director uh, for public health. This is not his first time to do it. It's, uh, he's actually done it uh, for some, uh, on different capacities. I mean, in, in different occasions, different years. And, um, but uh, I am going to begin with a testimony from those who are here to uh, testify. I, we have some signed up. And uh, right before they do that, if I could just read out the, the responsibilities of the Director of Public Health. Uh, of course, it's a government agency that addresses the wide range of health issues and provides multitude of public health and safety related services. Five divisions, including the Division of Environmental Health, the Division of Public Health, Division of General Administration, Division of Senior Citizens, Division of Public Welfare. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Public Health is the lead agency and the director is the Public Health Authority according to, uh, during the health emergency pursuant to 10 GCA chapter 19. All right, so we, we have signed up uh, two, three, four, five people. So we begin, uh, I've got Evelyn Claros, Rosanna Claros, Angel Sablon, the executive director of the Mayor's Council, welcome. And uh, Mr. Tom Nadu, who's chief environmental public health officer at the Division of Environmental Health. And, okay. Um, so we will begin with Evelyn Claros. Thank you for waiting and, and you may proceed. If you could just begin by stating your name for the record. Good evening, Honorable Senator Therese Terlahi, um, Senator Jim Moylan and Senator Tello Tadigui, um, and to the, if I miss anyone else, the remaining senators who are online. My name is Evelyn St. Augustine Claros. 
And I write in support of the confirmation of Arthur U. St. Augustine to the Director for the Department of Public Health and Social Services. I am blessed to have a loving, caring, and giving brother. My brother has a big heart and is always willing to help people. I as I was writing this testimony, I was reflecting when Art started EOG. He took a business course on his first semester. And just being the older sister, I once asked, how's your classes? His immediate response without any hesitation was, I need to change my major. I don't want to look at numbers and walls. I need to talk to people. The following semester, he took a social work course. So I waited a couple more weeks into the semester and I asked him, is this what you want? He said, it beats the first course in the first semester. I said, okay. As he was nearing his, his time to complete his career at UOG, I asked him, is it in, I asked him if he wanted to be a social worker and he said, yes. Today I can definitely say social worker is his passion and has been for over 30 years. I recalled when he first started his career at working for DOC and I asked him, do you enjoy your job? And he goes, it's interesting. And more importantly, he did enjoy it. When he moved to the Division of Senior Citizens, I expected him to move or transfer to another agency or another section within public health. But he continued to share with me, he enjoyed the job, he enjoyed the challenge, and that most importantly, I think he felt the reward of trying to help and give our seniors some opportunities in their senior lives. And he has been with DSC for maybe over two, two decades. Art is a perfectionist in all that he does. I recall my younger brother once saying, I am glad he doesn't work with me because he's an accountant and he can erase, but Arthur will not accept the report. Definitely Art picked that up from my mom the gift of being perfectionist. She always shared that when I give you a task to do, you do it right the first time. So you don't waste your time and energy to redo the task. Art is very hardworking and very committed and dedicated to his job. He gives so much of himself that truly sometimes I worry for his own health. When he shared with me that he was considering retiring, I was happy. And a few weeks later, he shared with me that they asked him to serve as a director and I got worried. I guess as the older sister, I, I worry for him. And thanks to WhatsApp, I can send him a message every day and ask him, how is he doing? because his work does not even allow him to really have much phone calls with me during normal hours. I am confident that Art will always do what's best for the department and may not always be the popular thing, the thing to do, but what is best in the interest for the department and for everyone that he serves. I pray for you every day, Art, that our Lord will always guide you to make you the, guide you to help you make the best decision, most especially during this time that we are challenged with this pandemic. Senators, I ask for your support to confirm my brother, Art, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, to provide my testimony.
Thank you very much, Ms. Claros. That was Evelyn Claros. Is um, there a Rosanna Claros to testify also? Please proceed. Good evening, Senator Therese Terlahi and the senators of the 35th Guam Legislature who are present here tonight. My name is Rosanna Sanagasin Claros, and today I am here in support of my uncle Art, you Sanagasin, to be the next director of public health. As a director, it comes with a large amount of responsibility, time, and dedication, and I believe my uncle Art is fit for the job. Growing up, I have always known my Uncle Art to be someone who is willing to help, take on many challenges, and most importantly, giving his time and energy without hesitation. I have experienced working with my Uncle Art and it was not easy at first. I found it to be difficult because I was still at a very young age and his expectations were very high. As time went on, I understood the outcome of his expectations and his expectations and everything was done within a timely manner, and the quality that was expected was shown through our work. Becoming the director of public health requires quality, quality of which I know my uncle Art will be able to provide for our island of Guam. I look forward to the many achievements he will accomplish in the future. As Winston S. Churchill said, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. Thank you very much, Ms. Claros. Excellent testimony. Um, we now have Angel Sablan, Executive Director of the Mayor's Council. Mr. Sablan. Mr. Sablan, I can't hear you. Uh, if you can unmute yourself, please. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman, Senator Therese Terlahi, and honorable members of the committee. I am Angel R. Sublan, Executive Director of the Mayor's Council of Guam. At the outset, let me just say thank you to all the men and women at the Department of Public Health and Social Services for your continued perseverance and sacrifices to defeat this enemy we call COVID-19. I am here this evening to testify in full support of the appointment of Mr. Arson Augustine as a director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. I do so both in a personal capacity as a close friend and in a professional capacity as a close colleague. Mr. Arson Augustine is no stranger to me or to my office. In fact, it was my privilege to interview Mr. St. Augustine in March of 1988 as an applicant for the Counseling and Case Work Services Division, position at the Department of Corrections. And I'm sure Senator Moylan knows this very well, as Art, the Senator and myself, spent many, many hours and days at the Department of Corrections. I apparently made the right decision when I hired him for his first job in Gulf Guam, because since that day, he has worked himself up the Gulf Guam ladder and all this time dedicating himself to helping others through his caseworker skills. He has served with dedication and has proven his skills and abilities in working with our residents and making decisions for them to improve the livelihood of our residents and provide sound programs for our elderly. Art has volunteered countless hours in many functions and activities held by various organizations within and outside the Department of Public Health and Social Services. The position of Director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services carries many responsibilities and wears many hats. I have witnessed the performance and work of art during his days as a social worker at DOC and as administrator of the Division of Senior Citizens at Public Health. He takes his responsibilities very seriously and wears any hat to fit his mission and Lord knows his mission at this time is anything but easy. I have no doubt that he will bring with him to the position of director an even greater enthusiasm and desire to make things better, healthier, and safer for the people of Guam. More importantly, he has committed to working hand in hand with the Mayor's Council of Guam to continue to carry out the programs for our senior citizens through our Senior Citizen Center and our adult daycare centers. Mr. Arson Augustine knows the people of public health and the people of public health know him. 
Art has a desire. Art has the will. Art has the passion. Art has the capability. The only ingredient missing is your support. Now it is my honor to support the appointment of Mr. Art St. Augustine, the Director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Art has already started his work as Acting Director since July 13, 2020. With your support and confirmation, Art can continue his work as the Director. This is Saina Mahasi, and please stay safe. Saina Mahasi, Mr. Sablan. Thank you. <clears throat> We now will hear from uh, Tom Nadu. Please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please state your name uh, again. And, sure. And My name is Tom Nadeau. Uh, I'm private life. I'm just a husband of Antoine Nadeau. In my public life, I am the Chief Environmental Public Health Officer. Um, so, uh, half of the Madam Chair and members of the Committee on Health, Tourism, Historic Preservation, Land, and Justice. My name is Tom Nadeau. When I'm at work, I am, like as I mentioned, I am the Chief Environmental Public Health Officer with the Division of Environmental Health of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. But when I'm not working, I am one of the 170,000 plus people who call Guam their home. As a resident of this island, there are many things I expect, and one of them is an effective and efficient government. This is particularly true of the very department that I work for, the Department of Public Health. And for that reason, I submit this written testimony in support of Mr. Arthur Yu San Agustin as the next director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. As a director, Mr. Sanjo's team will bring leadership, experience, and knowledge to one of the most important agencies in the government. I have known Art for at least, or at least his name and reputation since the first year of my employment at the Department of Public Health way back in 1992. However, it wasn't until 2004 when I truly got to know him as a fellow division head at the department when he confirmed his reputation as a hardworking, meticulous and capable leader. While leading my own division of environmental health, I have an occasion attempted to emulate the success of the division of senior citizens of public health, which Art had led for decades. As a current acting director, he's taken on the responsibility of leading public health during possibly one of the most challenging times any of us has or will face during our lifetime. In the past two months alone, Art has led the department with enthusiasm, focus, and inspiring calmness. I've seen him juggle multiple events, jumping from meeting to meeting, and addressing one challenge after another all day, every day, which would, cause, which would cause most to lose their mind or their temper or just simply give up. I have confidence in Art, Mr. San Agustin's ability to lead the department out of this pandemic and improve the Department of Public Health and Social Services along the way. I encourage this legislative, legislative body to confirm Arthur Yu San Agustin as the Director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Thank you and Sisu Masi. Thank you very much, Mr. Nadeau. Uh, we now have Dr. Jana Meglonia. Dr. Meglonia, can you turn your screen on to testify? All right, I'm gonna go to- I'm okay. here. <laughs> okay. Right. okay, sorry, I'm in the car. <laughs> so let me get my glasses on. Just a moment here. Okay. Good evening, Madam Speaker, Madam Chair, and Guam Legislature, and thank you for allowing me to speak at this time. Arthur St. Augustine has many years of service with public health and has served in various capacities, including division head, former director, and currently acting director. Leadership often makes a difference between an effective team and a team that struggles to meet its goals. And being a leader in the healthcare industry takes a unique set of skills, and Arthur has shown that he has what it takes. In the past few months as acting director, he has led by example and has, has inspired all of his team members to persevere and to complete the mission to the very best of their ability. Arthur excels in his communication skills, is clear and concise with his vision, and what needs to be accomplished. It is clear that he is someone who cares about what he does and has boundless energy in pursuit of his goals. He listens and learns and is flexible. He has integrity and good character. He shows empathy and gratitude and of sound character. Arthur is dependable and a man of his word. He is decisive and makes informed decisions by looking closely at data and predetermined goals. And once he formulates a plan, he commits and delivers. 
He has courage as evidenced by the fact that he returned from the jaws of retirement to take the helm of public health in its march against the COVID virus. Arthur has a gift of humor that brings levity to otherwise stressful situations. If I had had more time, I would have made this shorter, but I'd like to assure all concerned that acting director Arthur St. Augustine is fully capable to serve as Guam's director of public health. It is without hesitation that I strongly recommend that he be confirmed for this position. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Mangalotnya. My be pleasure. Ready. Thank you. Dr. Suzanne Kaneshiro. Good evening, Senator Trista Lai and members of the 35th Guam Legislature. My name is Dr. Suzanne Kaneshiro and I am the Chief Public Health Officer at the Department of Public Health and Social Services. I've been with the department for the last 28 years. I'm here in support of Arts and Augustine's confirmation as director of DPHSF. Governor Lulian Guerrero made an excellent choice when she appointed Art as director. I don't know any other person who is more qualified to be the head of one of the most important agencies in the government of Guam, especially now that we are in the midst of a public health emergency, trying to deal with a virus which nobody even heard of a year ago. He has managed to effectively and efficiently deal with every challenge he has faced since he became acting director. This is not an easy job. This job is for someone who is willing to commit his time to the job on a 24 hour basis. Art is that person. He works tirelessly seven days a week. When he is not attending meetings, he's either on the phone, replying to text or responding to emails. I'm in awe on his ability to multitask. He is accessible to government agencies, businesses, church leaders, counselors, and whoever else wants to talk to him. His number one priority is to ensure the health and safety of the people of Guam. The Department of Public Health and Social Services is very lucky to have someone like him to head the department. I ask for your support and to please confirm him as the next director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaneshiro. And uh, thank you for all of your service, all of you who've testified of your uh, service in this department for many years. All right, now we have Chima Bakwim. Thank you, Madam Senator, for letting me speak. Um, my name is Chima Bakwim. I am the program manager for tuberculosis and uh, Hansen disease for public health. Um, I am in support of um, confirming Mr. Adson Augustine as the director of public health. He is a leader you want to work with in a high pressure environment. Knowing that he will listen to expert opinion, trust your judgment, but has the confidence to make a decision and stand by it, which is very rare. He is a team leader who does not mind getting his hand dirty and leads by example. I believe he has the capacity to steady this ship and guide Guam to safety. He is a very trusted person and I look forward to his confirmation and um, it will be my pleasure to work for him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chima. And again, thank you for all your work as well. For the record, um, we've also received testimony uh, prior to the hearing from James Gillum, who is the former director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services, and from Charlene Senicolis, who is uh, uh, the program coordinator at the Department of Public Health and Social Services. And um, I'm going to call on one of my staff to read the testimony from Mr. Gillum, the former director. Uh, Charissa, if you could read that. Sure, Senator. The testimony is from James W. Gillen regarding the appointment of Arthur Eason and Augustine as director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Dear Senator Trelawney, I am James W. Gillen, a resident of Mangilao and a former director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. I submit this testimony in support of the appointment of Arthur Yusin Augustine as the director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. 
I ask that this committee recommend to the entire legislative body the confirmation of this appointment. I worked with Mr. San Augustine from April 2011 to February 2018. When then Governor Calvo appointed me to the director to be the director, Mr. San Augustine was graciously, graciously gave, gave of his time and experience to or, orient me to the department. He was a very helpful, he was very helpful even earlier on when we were working on the transition to a new administration. His contributions to the preparation of the transition report were very valuable. Arthur spent almost two weeks with me following my nomination. He took that time from his job as the administrator of the Division of Senior Citizens. His insights into the workings of the department were very useful and I was grateful for his assistance. Arthur, I think will always be a social worker at heart. Even though he went on to earn a master's level degree in human resource management, social workers are very special people who spend their time trying to make people's life situations better. His commitment to our island's elder citizens is remarkable, considering the challenges he faced daily, trying to provide meaningful services under restrictive federal guidelines and relatively minimal federal funding. Severe staffing shortages exacerbated the difficulties, but somehow Arthur found a way to make things work. That drive to serve the people of Guam, coupled with his years of experience, will serve him well as director. He is also willing to seek input from staff who, have, who may have insights into areas where he might not have direct experience. I am confident that he will be an effective leader of this department. Sincerely yours, James W. Gillen. Thank you very much for reading the testimony of um, Mr. Gillen. And now we will hear from Charlene St. Nicholas, who I believe is the acting director of the Division of Senior Citizens. Charlene? Yes, hi, um, good afternoon, um, Senator. Uh, greetings to the 35th Guam Legislature. Uh, I am Charlene St. Nicholas. I'm currently the acting senior citizens administrator for the Division of Senior Citizens. Um, I first joined the Department of Public Health and Social Services, working for the Bureau of Social Services Administration, which provides child welfare services for children and families. I was primarily assigned to coordinate and conduct community activities for child abuse prevention, mandated reporter presentations, and family violence prevention and awareness. In addition to formalizing the Foster Families Association for approximately 10 years to include various administrative duties. In 2006, I, I applied and received a promotion with the Division of Senior Citizens and have since been working for over 14 years, the, long, the longest period of my government service. Through the division and under the direction of then uh, Senior Citizens Administrator St. Augustine, the broad range of my programmatic and financial experience increased and enhanced. Acting Director St. Augustine is a great, great mentor who encourages independent thought and for employees to take initiatives and look at options and opportunities. He is a remarkable negotiator for budget negotiations. Very familiar with procurement from emergency procurement, requests for proposals, invitation for bids and memorandums of understandings. His correspondences, whether for interagency or external organizations is extremely detailed. His familiarity with budgeting and funding sources is very energetic. In the areas of program development and community enhancement of services, Acting Director St. Augustine is always encouraging, regardless of our staff shortage, as he is looking ahead to provide more services for our clients we serve. During this pandemic period, we need a director who is familiar with the department and the many facets of services provided. Our department needs a leader who is able to engage in department activities and to follow through. My work experience from procurement to budgeting in federal and local and grants evolved and enhanced with the guidance from Arthur Houston Augustine, MHR. I strongly support his appointment to this director post during these challenging times ahead for, of us, for the department, our clients, community, and partners. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nicholas. And 
now I think Deputy Director Duenas has signed up. Uh, Laurie, if you could turn your, um, unmute yourself, thank you. I'm sorry, I thought I did that. Um, Madam Chair, uh, good evening and thank you uh, and the 35th Guam Legislature for having me um, be here to testify. I am Lauren Desef Duenas, Deputy Director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. I would like to thank you and all the members of the committee for allowing me to testify today in support of the nomination of Mr. Arts and Augustine for the position of Director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. I have known Mr. St. Augustine for many years. He has decades long history of serving the people of Guam in multiple roles, including as a social worker, an educator and an administrator. He has utilized his training and expertise in the fields of social work, senior citizen and public health to improve the quality of healthcare on Guam and to enhance community efforts to reduce illness and injury through education, prevention and risk reduction. I have seen firsthand Mr. St. Augustine exhibit, exhibiting exemplary intelligence, practicality and strong, decisive and visionary leadership skills. Mr. St. Augustine brings a unique mix of personal and professional qualities and accomplishments that will strengthen the department and ensure that all Guam residents receive equal and continued access to quality, comprehensive and competent public health services during the time of pandemic. Given, given his wide ranging experience in public health and social services, and in his understanding of the challenges and potential of this bill, I am confident he will serve as a capable and visionary director. Mr. St. Augustine has an extensive resume that covers years in the health field. He has over 30 years with the Department of Public Health and Social Services, working in a variety of positions with federal funders and local vendors. Mr. St. Augustine's dedication and commitment to public health is shown by his many years of service to the people of Guam as an administrator and a leader in public health. Mr. St. Augustine is not only highly qualified to assume this directorship, but will also provide leadership in public health at a time when this is much needed. Since 2019, I was able to observe Mr. St. Augustine take the leadership during the dengue crisis, the electrical fire at the Central Public Health Facility and the pandemic crisis. Senators, the magnitude of the COVID-19 pandemic needs a strong leader who is knowledgeable about building capacity among its workforce, quarantine, isolation, contact tracing, investigation, understanding the recovery phase of the pandemic and the need for long-term planning. He has a proven track record in working with the private sector, in developing a statewide system. Mr. St. Augustine is passionate about improving health in Guam and has the skill set as well as the commitment to be effective. We look forward to working with Mr. St. Augustine to improve health and the healthcare system for our communities through public private collaboration. I have worked with Mr. St. Augustine for more than 10 years at the Department of Health. And in that time, I have seen his passion and commitment to public health and the people of Guam. Mr. St. Augustine is a strong supporter of transparency in government, 
He recognizes the need to inform and educate the news media and public to effectively convey the most accurate and timely health guidance and best practices. Mr. St. Augustine is a skilled communicator who invokes trust, credibility, and understanding of sometimes complex and, complex and controversial issues. He will move public health initiatives forth for the benefit and interest of the people of Guam. An effective collaborator and leader who is highly respected for his professionalism and expertise in both the public health and the healthcare community. He has a broad understanding of many aspects of healthcare, social service and public health, which fit him well for leading our large and varied Department of Health. I admire Mr. St. Augustine's empathy and quick understanding, but most of all, I appreciate his willingness and energy for taking action to address problems. I strongly urge you support Mr. St. Augustine's confirmation. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director Duenas, and thank you also uh, for helping public health through this uh, health emergency. Uh, I know it has, uh, I'm sure it has uh, been a lot of sacrifice for all of you. Okay, so that was a surprise for me because not all of those people had testified, I mean, had signed up in advance, and I'm impressed with the testimony that were, they were able to come up with uh, uh, during this time. So, uh, but I'm going to ask a couple questions and open it up for my colleagues. So, um, for the record, Mr. St. Augustine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to note you have uh, 19 plus years of service. I think someone said 20 uh, through the Department of Public Health. You began with the Adult Protective Services in 1989, and that uh, you were serving in as acting director from 2006, 2007, and 2011. And um, I beg your pardon, but I forgot to ask you to testify, Mr. St. Augustine, and you're probably wondering what's wrong with me. I'm just really <laughs> right in the reading Why did he say that? But okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's been a long day, I'm sure. Longer oh, for yeah. you. But uh, yeah. Mr. St. Augustine, please, it's uh, your floor right now. Well, I, I just thought we had a different process tonight. So it's different I'm so tonight. Sorry. Thank oh, no, no apologies, necessary chair, chairperson. When is Chairperson Therese Terlai? Committee on Health, Tourism, Historic Preservation, Land and Justice, Vice Chair, Sabina Perez, and also Senator Will Castro, Senator. Yeah, I've got my camera on. Do you want them to see it? Senator Jim Sorry, Marlin. Dr. Manglonia, yeah, if you can mute, okay. Uh, Senator Tidegree, Ty and I know earlier she was with us, I'm not sure if she's still with us, Vice Speaker, uh, I'm sorry, Speaker Tina Lee Bright. Now, before I testify, I just want to thank all of you, my family. And uh, my friends and my professionals, uh, just for your support. So, so thank you to all of you for your endorsement tonight. Evelyn and Zev, Angel, thanks for believing in me and giving me my first governor Guam job. <laughs> Corrections, mom didn't even want me to work there. She thought I'd become a victim, but I survived. And of course, all of you else who work with me in public health, Dr. Kenneth Shiro, you and I have known each other with Tom for many years as division heads. Dr. Janet, it's been great knowing you. It's still great knowing <laughs> you. Of your wall. Charlene, it's always a pleasure working with you. And Chima and Lori and Terry, it's all really been great working with you. So, this evening, I want to share my thoughts in the post of director, acting director at this time. I am Arthur John and Joe San Augustine, and I appear before you this evening through Zoom, seeking your support for me to serve as a director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. I am humbled and honored of the appointment by Governor Lou Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Joshua Tenorio to serve in this capacity. I recall our discussion when asked to serve in this capacity, that is, 
to serve the people while working to raise community awareness of the services provided by the department, to be a public service to the health and welfare programs provided by the department. My career in government spans over 32 years of actual service. My career started in 1988 with the Department of Corrections, moving on to the Adult Protective Services Unit, Division of Senior Citizens, Department of Public Health and Social Services, and eventually serving as the Administrator of the Division of Senior Citizens from 1996 to 2020. Through my career in public health and social services from 1996 to 2020, I also served as Acting Director and Acting Deputy Director. In addition to working in these two key agencies, I have also had the opportunity to teach at Guam Community College and the University of Guam. I have a bachelor's degree in social work from the University of Guam and a master in human relations from the University of Oklahoma Advanced Programs, Anderson Air Force Base Guam. Senators, Chairperson, Vice Chair, I am committed to being a service to the people in the capacity of director. I'm prepared to lead the staff to promote programs and services throughout the department to achieve our mission, to assist the people of Guam in achieving and maintaining their highest levels of independence and self-sufficiency in health and social wealth. The Department of Public Health and Social Services is comprised of five divisions, senior citizens, public welfare, environmental health, public health, and general administration, or the director's office. The body of work the department encompasses ranges from providing meals to our seniors, providing SNAP benefits to families, supporting their ability to purchase food for their families, providing health coverage for families to access affordable health care, inspecting health regulated establishments to protect us from foodborne illnesses and outbreaks, providing immunization to our school aged children to build their immunity from preventable diseases, managing two region healthcare centers and to being front and center in response to today's health, public health emergency, COVID-19 pandemic. In the Division of Senior Citizens, the mission of this division is to plan, coordinate, implement, and evaluate programs and services to identify and leverage all possible resources towards promoting, maintaining, and protecting, and protecting the total well-being of older persons while safeguarding their dignity, integrity, independence, values, and cultures. This division is a hallmark of services when viewed in the cultural context of taking care of our Nainafa, our Manamko. The division provides home and community-based services to support our elderly to age in place, to live a dignified and independent life for as long as possible, to delay, if not altogether, prevent the premature institutionalization of our Manamko. The division's programs assist families, caregivers, and friends to help care for our seniors. The programs are critical to the lives of our Mainainata. It provides them nutrition, recreation, and socialization opportunities, all purposeful for our seniors to enjoy their golden years. For some, it provides daycare supervision, transportation to access services, support at home to maintain their home, and nutrition for them. In addition, there are support services afforded caregivers to ensure they are energized, provided relief and support to continue their role as caregivers. This role of caregiving, family and friends take on, provides relief to our government who otherwise would be assuming this growing expense to provide care and support to seniors who are no longer able to care for themselves independently. The division continues to provide our elderly and adults with a disability from abuse, equipped with an emergency shelter and 24 hours, seven days a week hotline. In addition, the division provides information to the community of seniors, caretakers, guardians, and family members to make informed decisions. Notably, after over a year without legal services for seniors, in collaboration with Guam's Public Defender Service Corporation, PDSC, the division has entered into a memorandum of agreement with PDSC for the provision of legal service that would include legal workshops and the opening of Guam's first elder justice center. The center will serve as a, fo a focal point for inquiries on legal services for seniors, keeping abreast of legislation that affects seniors and dissemination of information of legal services available to seniors on Guam. The Division of Public Welfare 
This division provides assistance to low-income individuals and families. Its mission is to promote positive social conditions that contribute toward the attainment of the highest social well-being of the economically and socially disadvantaged population within the territory of Guam by developing an efficient and effective delivery system of services to eligible clients, by determining eligibility of applicants, and by administering payments in various social services to, re to remove social barriers, which prevent persons from obtaining, maintaining the basic necessities of life to include access to safe and decent housing, medical care, nutritious food, and employment. In working with the Bureau of Economic Security, the Bureau of Social Services Administration, Bureau of Management Support, and the Bureau of Healthcare Financing, we will continue to assist our clients, their families, and children to access public assistance benefits, protect and safeguard our children from weakened family support systems and abuse, ensure quality control of benefits is adhered to, and provide access to affordable health care. The myriad of programs managed by DPW assist our Guam community with the provision of food, health coverage, and protection of children, processing of adoption and foster care placements, training for employment, and support of child care providers. With the Division of Environmental Health, their mission is to serve and protect the people of Guam from environmental hazards and drug diversion through education and the implementation of governing laws designed to prevent injuries, diseases, disabilities, and deaths. The two primary goals of DEH are to provide environmental health education to the public and to enforce environmental health laws, all for the purpose of protecting the public's health. It is my intent to ensure the two primary goals of DEH are upheld, most especially in the face of our current public health crisis. DEH operates through the mandates of 24 statutes, which have been enacted for the prevention and or control of public nuisance, vectors, misbranded and adulterated consumer commodities, indoor smoking, littering, radiological health, and the sanitary control of health regulated establishments, such as food facilities, institutional facilities, public pools, cosmetic establishments, and hotels. In addition, DEH has a responsibility of preventing the diversion of pharmaceutical control drugs. I will continue to support the approach of DEH to respond to emerging concerns in our community. Operationally, the division flexibility shifts staff and programs, regardless of its organizational structure. In response to change in priorities, emergency response and continuity of operations. With 31 programs, which can be grouped into major functions, food safety, health and sanitation, animal and vector control, consumer commodities, radiological health and education. And with a staff of 24, the reality the division faces for years is the inability to fill approximately 80 field and office personnel to actively operate all of its programs. The Division of Public Health. This division aims to improve the quality of life through prevention and treatment of disease through the surveillance of cases and health indicators, and through the promotion of healthy behaviors. DPH, the Division of Public Health, manages over 30 grants within five bureaus. The Bureau of Communicable Disease and Control, which you heard from earlier, made up of Annette and Chima, includes the IMM, the Immunization Program, which manages, which manages the immunization of vaccines for children, cooperative agreement, TB program, which Chima is a part of, aims to control the spread of TB. And then we have the STD HIV program, which tests and screens for STD and HIV infections. The Guam Public Health Laboratory, Ann Santos with us this evening, which provides diagnostic laboratory testing to include chemistry, hematology, urinalysis, syphilis, chlamydia, leprosy, arboviral testing, dengue, and COVID-19, and epidemiology and laboratory capacity which we have our territorial epidemiologist with us this evening as well, is responsible for building and strengthening capacity within interrelated areas of epidemiology, laboratory, and health information systems. We'll move on to their next bureau, Bureau of Family Health and Nursing Services, it includes our maternal child health program, our nursing services, our home visiting program, and Project Carino. And I want to maybe just pause on Project Carino because this is one that is, works with children with social, emotional, and behavioral and mental health challenges. The Bureau of Nutrition Services, 
oversees the WIC program, Women, Infant, and Child program, which provides services to pregnant, postpartum, and breastfeeding women and children from birth to four years of age who are determined to be at nutritional risk. Then there is a Bureau of Primary Care, Ser Primary Care Services who oversees the Northern Region Community Health and Southern Region Community Health Centers, which provides primary care services to the underserved indigent and uninsured populations on Guam. Our Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Kenneth Shiro, who is also with us this evening, includes the Office of Vital Stats, issues birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, medical marijuana program, and the Community Health Services section, which includes the breast and cervical early detection program, behavioral risk factor, surveillance system, our diabetes program, to name a few, and our public health emergency program. We have received 22 Abbott ID Now machines from the U.S. Center for Disease Control, which is also managed by this division. The Abbott ID Now COVID-19 test is a rapid point of cure test that detects COVID-19 in 13 minutes or less. We as a practice A15, just to give us a little more time. The DPHS has loaned these Abbott ID machines to several medical clinics and facilities in Guam to assist the department in testing the community for COVID-19. I'm going to go by, uh, it's on record, but I'm not going to list all the uh, clinics, but I'll just list one or two, uh, Guam Medical Care and, and Guam Radiology Consultants. In addition, we have seven of these units, which we, are used, which we use for testing at, at the Northern Regional Community Health Center. And as noted earlier, we are also expecting an additional, what well, we thought 15, 14 for now, Abbott ID now is to be delivered to us, which we received earlier this afternoon. Senators, along with my team of deputy directors, clinicians and administrators, program coordinators and social worker staff, educators and prevention staff, administrative and clerical staff, and our maintenance and facility staff, we work to put forth an area of services that is quite encompassing. The work before me, and before us all, includes assessments, monitoring, investigating, diagnosing, communicating effectively to educate our community, strengthening and supporting communities, creating and implementing policies that impact health, environmental and social welfare programs, defining and utilizing legal and regulatory actions, ensuring an effective system that enables equitable access to services, building and supporting a diverse skilled workforce, improving services through evaluation and quality improvement efforts, and building and maintaining a strong workforce is a framework of this department. As a whole, the department works towards improving the well-being of our island community. We work to protect the health and promote social welfare, welfare initiatives in our community, from the individual to the family and back to the community. As a department, we will strive to work towards integrating health and social welfare programs to serve a common client. It is my intent that we shift to using a holistic approach in the care of our clients. No single effort will be as effective as a team approach. We need to work as a department and not be divided by distinctions of divisions and programs. We will shift to work as a team for the betterment of DPHS as clients. As a director, it is my intent to work with our private and government care partners to build partnerships that would translate to increase and coordinated services between entities. For example, if a specialist is needed, we could partner with a private clinic to provide the service and develop the incentive for the specialist to partner with PHSS. This is an exploratory discussion I am currently having with physicians and we are looking at how we can bridge partnerships for health services to be seamless between providers. Further, I will continue to work with the Pacific Islands Health Officers Association, PHOA, to ensure the voices of the Pacific nations are heard at the national level to safeguard our vested interests in the national landscape. The encompassing framework of the department will encompass a series of measures for us to move forward in the work before us. First item, mandates. We need to look and assess mandates that need to be amended to align with department resources and capabilities. Review existing mandates, rules, and regulations to improve operations, to seek increase in fees or fines, depending on the assessment of existing mandates, rules, and regulations. There may be the consideration to repeal mandates that are no longer enforceable or have been unfunded for years. The question will be with us and then to the public as to the validity and need of mandates that have not been funded 
therefore are difficult to implement, enforce, and execute. Training and mentoring. Enforcement, enhancement, excuse me, enhancement of staff skills to cross training of existing staff, which is intended to increase efficiency and productivity. We will continue, I continue my CDC exploration for leadership training and mentoring to build local management, mid-management capacity and skill set. Develop management training program for current and new managers. Develop a fiscal team responsible for tracking of planned and unplanned acquisitions and develop a grants management tracking team. In terms of preparedness, we will need to implement scheduled training to respond to today's and tomorrow's public health crisis. We must be prepared for another surge or pandemic, recognizing today's pandemic as a reminder of what we have been planning for and perhaps could never have imagined its impact, is, which is today's reality. The department will need to review and revisit its plan in order to properly respond to the evolving public health emergency today. Building structural capacity, I will work with the Division of Environmental Health to construct the capital improvement project from the Department of Interior for their environmental, health, environmental main facility. Also pursue funding with CDC partners for the development of Guam's public health laboratory. In terms of enhancing operations, we had to assess our department operations to identify staff levels required for efficient and effective operations. I just want to expand a little on that. The Department of Public Health and Social Services as a department, we need to determine how many people we actually need for each section to operate at a minimal level. It's great to have additional staff, it's great to build capacity, but we need to know that every division needs, for example, an administrative services officer or a admin officer. We have divisions that have gone without administrative staff and they suffer. It requires non-administrative staff to take on those job responsibilities. So it limits their ability to be effective program managers in the sense of exploring and expanding program services, but it definitely builds their administrative skills because they're, now they're completely proficient in terms of the access to the AS400. The other option or the other enhanced for operations is to assess where possible to automate our processes to be efficient and user-friendly, setting up a call-in system to request documents from the Office of Vital Statistics and this really stems from our current operation when we go into peak core one and we want to minimize face-to-face -face interaction for everyone's protection. But we also need to come up with a system that still gives our consumers, our clients access to their vital records. We have to shift from in-person to online virtual training for those applying for health certificates, new and expired, and only come into the department perhaps for on-site testing. This I've had a discussion with, with our chief from Environmental Hall, Tom Nadeau. And so this is something his division is already working towards, not just in the face of the pandemic, but it's also gonna be a viable option when we see a reduction in staff for whatever reason. This will minimize staff required to conduct training as well as limit face-to-face -face contact, especially in this time of the pandemic. We have to, I have to continue dialogue with CDC to assist to provide technical assistance for the proper management of grants to ensure our compliance and performance standards are achieved to include proper accounting of plan acquisitions and related expenses. We also have to assess to improve welfare program application determination and processing and providers claims processing. Senator, Chair, Chairwoman, I always struggle with that, but Chairwoman Terlahi and Vice Chair uh, Perez and all members of the 30 for the Guam Legislature this evening and all my family and colleagues and friends this evening. As I stepped into the role of acting director, the stark reality was immediate. No longer am I being faced with just the operations of the five divisions, needing to identify funding for program or operational shortfalls, recruitment being stalled, or the AC flatlining at the Southern Region Community Health Center. What was front and center was our ever moving response to COVID-19. It was apparent that the road before me was one that would require greater commitment and stamina for the work before me and the team of the department who have been at the front line since March, 2020. Therefore, I want to express my appreciation to the staff of public health and social services who have stepped up to the fight and to our partners for joining us in the fight before us. Senator, Chairperson, after two months of work that keeps me purposefully moving from the time I arrive to work to the time I leave, 
I remain committed to the challenge before me and before the department and our island. I know that with the team with me today, given the success, yes, success, and challenges that we turn into opportunities to do better, we will prevail in our fight against COVID-19. It is an honor to be a part of a team that is front and center in our response, in our response efforts to fight COVID-19. Therefore, I humbly request your support for me to serve as a director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Tiza Wismasi. Tiza Wismasi, um, Director of Public Health and Social Services. And, and thank you for taking the job seriously enough to really uh, dive into all, all those areas and your plans for those areas. I think that was a very thorough presentation. And um, uh, before I open it up for the senators to ask some questions of you or the others who have testified, there's one more testimony I'm going to allow. This is from Deputy Director Terry Uggen. His uh, testimony was supposed to be on our list, but uh, it got diverted, I think. So if we allow Mr. Uggen, Deputy Director. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the 35th Guam Legislature. Buenas and half a day. I am Terry Uggen, Deputy Director of the Guam Department of Public Health and Social Services. Mr. St. Augustine has invested over 30 years into learning the structure of DPHSS and has consistently contributed to the success of the agency. He has the public health institutional knowledge that can only be obtained by vested and dedicated commitment to the community. He manages to work efficiently under pressure and challenges individuals to heighten to their fullest potential. Mr. St. Augustine's exceptional social work background and professionalism was honored by the Guam Association of Social Workers when he received the 1990 Social Worker of the Year Award. I strongly believe that Mr. St. Augustine will continue to steadfastly hold true to the covenants of the social work profession and the Guam Department of Public Health mission to serve as a stellar example for others to emulate. He has mentored many of today's health professionals to help ensure strong and valuable networks of care services for future generations in this time of reduced resources and even more uncertain future. Today, Mr. St. Augustine continues to balance the role of Guam DPHS response in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. His skills allowed Guam to parallel the national incident management systems as a powerful response to the pandemic and has continuously improved quality of services by his ability to redirect staff to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover as needed. In his current capacity as DPHS Acting Director, Mr. St. Augustine continues to meet the challenges that DPHSS plays as the lead agency to fight against COVID-19. He understands Guam and nurtures the cultural hallmarks that make his unified and resilient. His tireless commitment to public health excellence is evident in his record of selfless services. Mr. St. Augustine is a strong, straightforward leader who represents much of what is good and right with Guam. It is without condition or reservation that I write this letter of support for the confirmation of Mr. Arthur U. St. Augustine as the Department of Public Health and Social Services Director. To Zeus Masi. Zeus Masi, Deputy Director. Art, uh, if I can call you Art. Um, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, absolutely. Chair, chairperson. I've known you for many years as well, and uh, but I've learned a lot about you also tonight and in working with you just so since you've been the acting director uh, during this health emergency. So uh, I want to just tell you that I admire your courage and your your commitment to our community, willing in your willingness to take this job on at this time. It I am sure it's what it's probably the most difficult job we've got besides the governors at this point. <laughs> And um, so uh, thank you very much. And thanks to all your team. And I know that you know you, you are able to jump in there and work hard because you've got a good team behind you. So I wanna thank all, all of you for all, all that you do. Uh, I really, you've answered all my questions, you know, and uh, except maybe, maybe I could just ask this one. And it's, um, 
How will you respond to political and community pressures, uh, particularly now when there's a lot of pressure from businesses to open or, you know, other factors to tell us to close it all down because, you know, you know, we want to be safe and we want to take care of our people. How are you going to respond to this pressure? And um, do you find that political pressure will interfere with your role? Well, you know, um, chairperson and members and team public health and social services, I can't say that there will be no political or community pressure. I believe that comes with a job. But I think I've demonstrated in the last two months that I've been able to balance the pressures both from the political front and from the community. What I look for is I look for my team. I look for their input, their guidance. I lean on them. We lean on each other. We sh there's many subject matter experts from the public health and social services. And as in chairperson, as you mentioned earlier, although maybe we have not been the best at giving information out in terms of data, we have data that we look at. We also attend the physician's advisory group and we look at that data. And that, that group also now includes Dr. Kenny Shiro and also Dr. Mingwonyu, who's our medical director. So in that group, we are actually, I know it may be hard to believe, but we actually express our concerns. We express, well, what if we could do this instead of, do we really need to go to PCOR 1? Can we get out of PCOR 1? And we look at the public health information. We look at the data. We look at the number of deaths, the number of hospitalizations. We look at our score, our CAR score, our test positivity, our test positivity rate for the last days, last seven rolling days. So it's not done without definitely consulting and looking at data and Sometimes it doesn't, it, the decision comes within a day or two and, and there is going to be pressure. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, blessed that I have someone like Tom who reviews these business plans. And uh, one thing we all know about Tom Nadeau, you know, this is not your confirmation here, Mr. Nadeau, but he's a straight shooter. <laughs> if it doesn't fit, he ain't going to approve it. And I can tell you that Tom and I work well together and I recommend, I, I respect his position and I can also tell you this tonight, up to this day, and I don't intend to ever change, I have never countered his recommendation when it comes to the opening of the business because he also looks at the general welfare and health of our community. So definitely it may one day look like I'm taking sites with a political agenda or a community site, but it's not done without due process and review of information before me. And that's how I would approach that Senator. Chairperson, I'm always having a problem with chairwomen. I'm so sorry to all the senators of the female side of the 35th Guam legislature. <laughs> or you can just call me Therese. All okay, right. Well, so, yes, and um, again, thank you for the details of your testimony and, and uh, all of you who have testified have shown us that, you know, different aspects of this nominee. And I think that that's uh, very helpful for all of us considering this. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on us as well, because we are now not just approving the director of public health, we are approving the public health authority to get us through the rest of this health emergency. And so, you know, it's a very heavy um, weight on all of us. So I'm going to open it now up to um, my vice chair, Senator Sabina Paris. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, uh, thank you, uh, Director, Acting Director San Augustine for your testimony and for stepping up to the plate to accept the nomination. And in hearing all the comments and, and uh, testimony, you know, it seems to me that you were an understudy for this position for, for the 30 years <laughs> that you were in the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Um, and I think it's always great to hear, um, you know, these glowing comments and endorsements from your, your own colleagues oh, that yeah. you work alongside with. And especially during this time, you know, I think that's something you really need uh, to support you through this through this time, so I think that's that's all positives on on you know on on, on this on, on your nomination hearing. Um, yeah, so I guess you know a lot of the questions you know I think you in your testimony you did answer some questions that I had about what is your your plan, and you know it, it seems to me that you were you know you're speaking about overhauling uh, the Department of Public Health and Social Services and, and or at least. Um, you know, modernizing it in a way that makes it more effective. And so that, that's really great to hear. But I think too, uh, and that you're balancing all, all the mandates. I think that's, that's you know, it's a Herculean task uh, that you as a acting director has to, to balance all the mandates within this agency. I think that's, it's huge. Um, and I'm, you know, I guess I'll be interested to hear more about which, you know, at least the conversation about which mandates you think uh, might be, you know, worth 
um, deleting or omitting at the um, Maybe perhaps you can speak about that if you have ideas or this is something that's just uh, um, Well, I'll, I'll make it really brief. Um, we have divisions and my colleague, my colleague at this time, Tom Udo, he is always short stuff and he has like so many mandates. And the truth of the matter is his division hasn't been able to manage all those mandates because he's never been fully funded to be able to do the work that he's committed to doing. So we really have to ask ourselves that question. If we have a mandate, it's not funded, it hasn't been funded, let's say for 25 years, we have to now go back in and weigh in whether is, there, is that mandate somehow already covered with another existing mandate or protocol that's already existing with the work that he does, or can the mandate be updated to reflect what he can do? And if we are going to maintain the mandate, eventually we're going to need to look at funding the mandate. Otherwise, DEH continues to operate with less people. They are supposed to do what, hundreds of inspections every year, but with the amount of staff they have, they can't, they can't meet that mandate. But I'm not saying to reduce the number of inspections. So it's also meeting on the other point is meeting with each division and, and asking them to do a review of their mandates and what have they found challenging? What have they found to be cumbersome that perhaps is not necessary? One of the mandates we have, and I'll speak because I know this quite well, is the Division of Senior Citizens. They spend probably less than $25,000 on Senior Citizens Month. I'm sorry, there's a bug in here, sorry. And um, they're required, and not that it's an issue for them, but in all the many years I've been with the Division of Senior Citizens, we submit an annual Senior Citizens Month report. And for the 20 plus years I've been with senior citizens, there's not been a single question to the report. So the question is really, for something that small in terms of dollar figure, less than 25, sometimes, sometimes you don't even have any money for senior citizens month. So the report really is, there's no money spent this year. So it's really the way in because staff time, especially when we're short, could be better used for other services that would help the seniors, coordination of services, program evaluation, program refinement, enhancement. So that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at guys want to come to work. We want to come to work, but we want to come purposeful and not feel like someone's beating down on us because we didn't do these mandates. We didn't carry this out. So one thing we can do is look at these mandates and see if they're somehow already being done, that we can modify or amend them. And so that people come to work and you feel accomplished. And so when I have a mandate looming over me that I cannot meet because I don't get funding, then we get a call for an oversight. Oh, you haven't done this in how many years? Well, we haven't been funded. It's either we fund the mandate and then we would end up losing, for example, a warm body or having to unfund a, a vacant funded position because we, we need that. I'm so sorry there's a bike behind me somewhere here. So that's what I'm looking at in terms of mandate. It's not to do a sweeping across, let's just change all the mandates. It's working with the division heads. They know their divisions very well and we're working with them so that they can make recommendations on how to improve their operations in line with their rules, regulations, and mandates. So that's what I'm looking at. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think I want to leave uh, time for my colleagues to ask questions. But oh, thank I'm you. so sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank for you Senator Harris. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm getting notices from our AV department that uh, we have to wrap up before by 8.45, but uh, Senator Taitigui, Minority Leader. Introduce Masi, Madam Chair. And, um, you know, Art, uh, I've always, I, I don't know you real personally, personally. I, I just, when I do run into you, you seem very focused and, uh, you know, determined. I've seen you at public hearings speak, uh, talk about issues. And um, everything you've said is, is basically spot on. But what really caught me today um, was, you know, I, I see this dentist I've been seeing for 20 years. And I go to him all the time. And every once in a while, he's a very outspoken guy. And every once in a while, I ask him questions about certain individuals, especially, you know, healthcare, when it comes to healthcare. And I asked him, I said, so, Doc, what do you think of Arthur St. Augustine? And he goes, oh, yeah? That's, that's my brother-in-law. And I had no clue he was your brother-in-law. <laughs> Dr. Yashihiro, yep. 
<laughs> and, and you know, he's a kind of guy, the straight shooter. He does not uh, leave anything out. And I said, okay, well, am I going to hear an honest opinion? And he said, this guy will do what's in the best interest without any political influence in the best interest of the department. And that's coming from a guy who's very opinionated, who's actually served on many boards. Yes, that, that just, you know, uh, says a lot about you. You know, I don't know you personally, but hearing it from here, and then I didn't even know your sister was Evelyn. I had no clue she was your sister as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're all like, that was your sister. So no, that's um, a lot of surprises, <laughs> a lot of surprises. Um, and, you know, another one have, having Jim Gillen, uh, testify on your behalf was pretty impressive. You know, that, that guy's a straight shooter too as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, he works really hard. And um, just having that testimony is, is, is very good. But, uh, you know, Art, I, I just knowing all the people you surround, even I, I know your personal friends, you know, the Denancy group, I call them the, yes. you know, the different, <laughs> different group, Glenn yeah. and them. And uh, they're good people. Yes, you know, and you could usually tell a person's character by the people they hang out with. So um, I love your friends. <laughs> they're good friends. <laughs> and they're good people. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I wish you the very best. Uh, I know you're going to do a great job. And I just want to leave with all the those individuals here testifying on from public health. You know, you're doing a great job. And this morning, too, it was all about medical for me today. I had my checkups here. And there was a song that was just distributed today. It was from Alicia Keys. And I'd like to dedicate that song to everyone at Public Health for all your work. And please look on it on YouTube. It's from Alicia Keys. And it's, uh, the song is called Good Job. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I've heard that song, so that's very appropriate. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Castro? Thank you, Madam Chair. Gosh, um, I've known Art for 20 years at least, and uh, <laughs> he's been consistent in at least two ways. Uh, Madam Chair, he's consistently professional, and he's consistently in love with helping the people. Uh, it's, it's worth noting for the record that he's clearly highly qualified for the position he's been nominated for. Uh, but like my the previous speaker, uh, my leader, uh, it's his character and priorities that I want to highlight during this public hearing. Uh, so, para hago este no señor San Agustín, se dos más no para aceptar este no posición mo. Thank you for accepting. Really, um, you know the character references speak volumes about you. First of all, you had uh, Jim Gillen. Uh, he doesn't hand out references easily. Uh, he sets very high standards. The former director in his written testimony, went so far as to say, Art, that um, your service for the Manamco is, and I quote, remarkable. Um, you know, si dos masi pari sa bisyon mo, sa paraguaho, sen importante edzo, mas preciso edzo, na po na po la nazi i Manamco siya. For me, Art, that is uh, one of the deepest and heaviest uh, priorities of my own to, to look over and care for our Manamco. So, I'm really impressed with that statement from the former director. Uh, Dr. Kanashiro, whom I had the uh, brief privilege of working with in the last administration, also spoke in support of your confirmation. And I trust your judgment when it comes to programs and the assessment of one's professional capacity. She too is not easily impressed, especially with bureaucrats and politicians. Mm -hmm. So I can say that I appreciate your due diligence uh, in terms of your attention to ensuring compliance uh, with federal programs in terms of the efficacy of the program programs and the, the fiscal side of that. So uh, Thank you for your service. I offer you courage and encouragement on your new journey of leadership. Your uh, the additional leadership position you're about to hold and yes i support the appointment and yes i will vote in affirmation of your confirmation uh, many blessings to you and to all those you lead into the department as well thank you madam chair for the privilege to speak uh, at mr sanagasin's public hearing confirmation hearing. thank you thank you very much senator castro senator thank moylan thank you madam chair 
art is, it was interesting. Angel reminded us, uh, I guess, <laughs> I, I guess uh, working in prison together kind of prepared us to where we are today. So I like we're working, right? we were working together back then. I'm looking forward to uh, working with you and, and your committee chair there, Senator Tulahi on making those improvements that you're suggesting and introducing those measures that we need to uh, to help uh, your department. So I'm looking forward to that. Congratulations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Moreland. Thank you, Senators, for, for sticking through the details of this confirmation hearing, the details of the tracing and, and tracking that and investigations that the department is doing. And thank you, especially Art, for, um, again, being willing to do this. Uh, it, it takes a lot of courage, I think. Uh, and thank you for your commitment and your promise to, to withstand the politics of it. And I know, okay, we've known each other for many years and Art was younger than I was. So, you know, when you grow up together, you think, oh my, you know, he's gonna be the director. Uh, yeah, interesting. but. I've watched him over the years as, as the Division of, of Senior Citizens Director, and, and he's done a great job. But I've actually been pleasantly surprised by your ability to handle the current job. And so we are here to help you in any way we can. I know you've put up with me, you know, kind of harassing you constantly since you've been the acting director. I did it to Linda too. Late night, she was up all the time. So we're both the same. We can uh, chat with each other on the stuff that's bothering us late at night because this, that's just the way this pandemic is. I mean, things are changing every day. It's hard to stay on top of the information. It's hard to be able uh, to convey that information. So I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think any of the uh, professionals at public health, uh, you know, want very much to deal with the politicians, but we are all in this together at this point. And I think that what we've got in common is, you know, what you are doing, you are doing for all of us. And we are so very grateful, but we also want to help you because I think that what you know if we can help you get that out to the community and if we can help you to translate that to every single segment of this community and help you to convince them that what you are doing is based on data, it's based on logic, it's based on care and love and all of those things combined, if we just want to help you in this regard. And we are aware of the short falls in, um, you know, for many years, and, and when it comes to the Department of Public Health in funding it, in mandating it to do all kinds of things and, uh, you know, not giving it adequate support. So I am, I am um, very happy, I have to say, that I am seeing changes. I am actually seeing changes, and uh, I'm very happy about that not just for your perseverance and not just for, you know, how nice you are to deal with as a professional, but because I'm seeing changes in the department. And I think that's for all of you who are here on this uh, Zoom with us tonight, uh, the division directors, thank you for your perseverance. And I'm hoping we, we can get what we need, money, we can get uh, support and we can get, just do a, just uh, get what you know out to the community. I think uh, it's always been your struggle. It's always been all of our challenge, right? It, it's health. You know, what we know about health, what we know about causes disease, what we know, you know, is safer for us versus more at risk, puts us at risk. Those are all the things you all have been dealing with for all of your, your years there at the department. And now it, it's just really, um, you know, exacerbated and exemplified and, 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 we need the entire community to help us. So I'm wishing you the best and I wish all of you continued success and continued um, perseverance. And, and thank you again, if we don't say it enough, thank you from all, all of us at the legislature and for my family. And we want to thank you for all your hard work. And I know it has been a lot of sacrifice. So again, Masi and Art. Thank you very much, Chairman. Chairwoman. <laughs> Can we <get> <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And so um, there being no other testimony, I want to thank you all again. And uh, 
it is, let me just read the time, 8.26 p.m. Uh, Sizilis Masi, folks. Thank you.